So I'm Jan Nussbaum. I'm the Assistant Director for Professional Development here at Golden Gate. Uh, I've been here about six months. I was in, um, I practiced for about 16 years, uh, was in-house for most of that, but I did do some contracting work and a little freelance. Um, but I am very much a novice in terms of what's involved in a solo practice. Um, we are really excited to bring you this program. Um, it's going to be really interesting and really informative, and I think just by the number of RSVPs we got, um, it seems like something that people really want, and that's why you're here on a Saturday morning when there's the big 49er game going on and everything else. Um, so with that, I wanted, to, I wanted to give thanks to three people. We um, literally did not have enough room. Um, according to the fire marshal, to um, have some staff come in. So we have three of the attendees who are actually helping us. Um, Mickey, Benet, Yvonne Lee, and Toby Erickson, who's sitting there with the camera. So I just wanted to really thank them, because they're doing this on top of um, trying to pay attention. Um, we're going to have a really, really packed day. So um, we purposely, um, I'm not going to introduce our panelists. Um, we've provided a copy of, their, of the bios, which you should have received, and a copy of the agenda. Hopefully you signed, um, if you want MCLE, you signed in and got an evaluation form, which we can collect at the end, and then at the end of the day, we'll give you the MCLE certificate. Um, we also have a great resource table, kind of back over there in the corner, so when you leave, um, be sure to pick those up if you haven't before. Um, there's one in particular, a couple things in particular I wanted to um, mention. The first one is, um, this is a wonderful uh, set of handouts that um, now uh, the National Association of Legal Professionals um, gave out at a conference last year. And um, it's got a lot of checklists and, and different information to read and resources on places you can go to get more information. Because obviously in a, a workshop today, we're not going to be able to cover everything. Um, so be sure to pick that up. Um, this is a wonderful book, Solo by Choice by Carolyn Elephant. They just came out with, she came out with a new edition recently. Um, this is the old one. Um, but this is a really good book and a really good reference. Um, okay, so with that said, I'm going to um, uh, start to get going. I wanted to mention we're going to have five one-hour sessions. Uh, we're going to, uh, at, at the end of each session, try to give five minutes for question and answers. And then at the end of the day, around 2.30, we're going to have sort of a wrap-up um, and half hour of more question and answers, because you're probably not going to have everything answered in the, in the five minutes after each session. Um, OK, I think that was it. So this first session is going to be, is solo practice right for you? What are some of the attributes that solo practitioners need? Um, well, one thing I should say, we have 11 panelists, so we sort of mix things up. Most of our panelists are going to be on, they're all on at least two panels. Um, some are moderating. Um, uh, DeWitt Lacey, unfortunately, isn't here, so we're down to 10. Uh, but what's nice is that the, the different panelists that we have have different years out, everywhere from 30 years out to a couple years out. They all uh, practice in different substantive areas, and they all um, are in different locations throughout the city. We have a couple, a couple attorneys from Napa. So you're going to get a real array of um, uh, answers to the different questions. So the first one that I have in this area of is solo right for you um, is around sort of drive and ambition. And that sort of struck me as something that, you know, if I was going to start my own business, really, is what it is, is I, I think you just have to have a huge passion for it and huge drive. Um, so I'm going to direct this to Jody Santiago. Um, how energized and excited were you about starting your own practice? Um, and how did you design your practice to keep that energy going? Okay, well, initially when I graduated, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do, can you guys hear me on the mic? Mm -hmm. yep. I knew immigration is what I wanted to do, and unfortunately the economy was tanking all around. So I had done some contract work, and then I just wasn't finding what I wanted, and I wasn't willing to go outside of immigration, and so I just knew that that was exactly what I wanted to do. And then a space opened up in a friend's building, and it just sort of all fell into place really quick. But it was sort of like a week in between like finding the space and being like, OK, I'm going to do this. 
So um, I would say if a great opportunity comes by, something that's too good to pass, I wouldn't pass on it because I found someone that was willing to give me a short-term lease, but it could be permanent. Um, so I wasn't too scared about taking that on. And um, it just sort of all fell into place. And like I definitely would say that it, I think you have to have the love for what you're doing because there's times when it gets hard and so you know you're the one that's motivating yourself every day so I think the passion is really important so find something that you love doing that you're wanting to get up every day and do it or work overtime because you know you're gonna work harder for yourself than you would ever work for anyone else. Did um, any of the other panels have additional or different perspectives on how they kind of energize themselves and um, actually, I have a couple comments. Um, one of the things I think it's really important to remember and to dovetail on what Jody said is that you're really wearing two hats. You're wearing, you have the passion to actually start your own business and also the passion to do whatever substantive area of law that you're doing. And you're going to spend a lot of time doing both of those things. And it's probably going to equate to, as Jody said, well more than 40 hours a week. So, you know, just as, as you're... Um, you can really capitalize on that energy and on that enthusiasm for some of the business planning parts of it, which will really serve you well in the long run because you'll know, okay, you know, it's not set in stone, but when I'm about two years out, I want to be here, I want to take these kind of cases, or maybe at three years out, I want to bring someone in to help me. So um, having that drive, you know, just remember that you're going to concentrate it in two separate areas, which is um, both the practice area, the business part of it, and your substantive law. Absolutely. A drive and ambition, I think it's very important to go into an area that you're <laughs> super excited about and you're passionate mm -hmm. about. For me, that was trial law because Bernie Siegel was one of my mentors here who recently passed away. So don't go into real estate law because that's what your mom or dad wants you to do when you really want to be a sports agent, but that may be harder to break into. You're going to have a long, long, long career <clears> doing it. So make sure you're happy and pumped about it uh, when you start. So the next thing I want to ask about is confidence. Um, and I'm going to direct this to Janet, I think. I mean, how, how were you convinced you were the right person to open a solo practice? Well, I'd say <clears throat> sheer ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I came I came to solo practice a little bit differently than these other panelists. I uh, I was got out of law school and I was working uh, for a small firm <clears throat> for about a year, and the partnership broke up, and the building that we were in was demolished and I was left with the choice of getting a job or opening my practice and it was a recession uh, nobody was hiring so I thought it'd just be easier to hang my own shingle so um, so that's where the ignorance comes um, but I never have looked back and never have regretted it uh, because the confidence comes from believing in yourself and uh, and learning on the job. And, and I think ultimately, uh, for me, I found a uh, I found a share office situation. I mean, the idea is to keep your overhead low, low, low. So I found a shared office space, which I thought, well, I'll just try it out. I'm going to be here three days a week, and somebody else is going to be here two days a week. And uh, it turned out that the other fellow never showed up, so <laughs> I kind of got my, my shared space office full time. And I just told everybody I could do anything that they didn't want to do. And I learned on the job. So. I think you just have to have confidence in yourself and you all, all, if you have graduated from law school and have passed the bar, you are ready <laughs> to practice on your own. You know more about the law than a lot of lawyers do at, at the point where you have graduated and passed the bar. Okay. Oh, do you want to I was just going to say, like, I, you know, I initially, 
I had in law school worked for a big firm, and they were who I kind of thought was the absolute top of the field. And when I was working there, I would notice that the attorneys would often give me these projects that they didn't know the answers to. You know, I'd be like the grunt doing all the research. And I just realized after that that even the people that you think are at the top like don't know all the answers. And so when I went out, I would often call my mentors and say, you know, I had this question. And they'd be like, that's a really great question. And so I realized that, you know, like even the people often that you think know all the answers or who are the con considered experts are still going to go and either look it up themselves or have someone look it up for them. So, you know, if you, know, if you have any sort of legal research abilities, I feel like you can, like after graduating from law school, especially someplace like Golden Gate where research is sort of like pounded into us, I feel like you can do it. It's just a matter of like, you have to go do it, you know, and not to be scared of taking on something that you don't know the answer to because you're going to realize that a lot of people don't know the answer. It's just sort of the ability to like actually go and find it. That's really good advice. Um, I have a question for Al. Um, what happens when you you lose a client? How do you keep your confidence going, or, or or you're just not getting much business at a certain period in time in your practice? How how do you keep that confidence confidence up? <clears throat> you you trick yourself into being confident <laughs> by paying attention to what's <laughs> circling around your head, uh, your self talk, if uh, <clears throat> that's a term. Um, yeah, so bad things are going to happen to you. You're going to get fired. I was fired by a client, and you, you basically learn from it. You take every failure as an opportunity to learn and to get better. And when I was fired, I, I was fired because I wasn't paying attention to my client and who was influencing them and talking, talking to them. And I think everybody would agree that uh, the longer you practice law, the more you realize that... Um, Paying attention to your client's needs and being empathetic uh, to what they're going through is important. But in terms of setbacks, I think you just embrace them and look at them as opportunities to learn and to do better going forward. Uh, there's a saying, whoever fails the most ends up accomplishing the most because you, you learn and you keep uh, marching forward. I, and by the way, I didn't know you lost a client. I just threw the oh, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. sure. It was devastating. <laughs> you know, like, oh. I think if you've been mm -hmm. practicing, mm -hmm. we, uh, Janet and Al have practiced a long time, I guess it's inevitable you're going to lose clients over time. And, yeah, that's, a, that's really helpful. Clients come and clients go. And uh, I do a family law practice. <clears throat> Some of my cases I have for 18 years, the length of the, a child's majority. In some cases, you have, you know, for a very brief time. So there's always um, turnover in your in your in your caseload, and the lean times. Uh, you call your friends, your other lawyers. You take people out to lunch, and and you let them know that your business is uh, you're open for business, and that you know they know anybody. Um, so. You just have to be assured that your next case is going to come in somewhere, because it will. The other thing I found is don't, like I used to say, it, don't count your clients before they're hatched. Like I would get a prospective client call, and I would get so excited, and I would even start doing all this research and like planning the whole case out in my head, and then it was really hard initially when, you know, for whatever reason, either financial or just it, that client didn't end up coming through, and it was, you know, at that time when I could count the number of clients on my hands, that it was like really exciting to think I'd get this client. And so I've really trained myself to, you know, until I have like a signed contract and like a retainer or something, like don't count that client as a client. And, you know, you don't want to be harassing potential clients. <laughs> so it's just one of those things that you need to like keep it in check. That although, you know, you're starting out and you're really excited to work, it sometimes takes a little while for your practice to build. Um, the next question I had is, um, is um, I'm sorry, I lost my place here. I want to make sure I get the right place. Um, building a client base involves getting yourself um, known to other attorneys in the field and potential clients. So how important is it to be 
outgoing and extroverted, or is that really not necessary? It's, you know, sort of half of one doesn't does the other. Um, because personally, I mean, over, I guess I've been out of law school now 25 years, I've known lots of solo practitioners, and some are extremely extroverted, and some are very introverted. So um, I guess I'll throw it out to the panel. What, what do you think on that in terms of personality trait? I'm happy to uh, start. I, I think your personality is your personality. And people are going to hire you because, uh, A, they have found you in some fashion. They found you, come to you by way of some way. And so what's important, in my view, is to get out and let people know that you're in practice and what kind of practice you do. I found, um, for me, uh, roads to success in that area <clears throat> were that I, I joined other legal organizations. I, uh, I became active in the Italian American Bar Association. That was a fun, great organization. I was uh, part of the uh, Inns of Court, which is a very interesting organization. If you can uh, get into it, it's uh, based on the English barristers system, um, Inns of Court. And it's, they have a sort of a teaching aspect to it. And because I was a solo in the Inns of Court, the Inns of Court that I belonged to was primarily made up of lawyers from big firms. These are lawyers that I would never really have an opportunity or reason to run into. But we got to know each other through the course of, of my belonging to this organization. And they don't do divorce or custody, and they said, oh, well, I know a family lawyer, and I would get referrals through that. Um, certainly, family and friends are a good way if you belong to other business associations. I don't think you have to be out there and you know be rah, rah, rah. I think you just have to be, um, let people know that you're practicing law, that you're, you've hung your shingle, that you're open for business, and um, that you're willing to take on matters. Uh, certainly when I started out, I did a lot of everything. I ended up doing family law because I was in a, where my share space was in my offices. None of the other lawyers wanted to do family law. They all knew better. I had, I had had a little bit of family law practice. I said, oh, I can do family law. And so they'd send me the family law matters. So that's actually how I ended up doing family law. But um, I, I think you should take the best, you know, you should think about who you are in terms of your personality. If you're a quiet person, that's, that's fine. You still have one-to-one -one contact with other people. Um, I, I do recommend that you get involved in professional organizations, business organizations, <coughs> your church, uh, and just let people know that you're out there and that you're taking cases. I would add on what Janet said, and I got involved, like in my area, there's a lot of nonprofits that work, like I do immigration, and so there's a lot of nonprofits that either take on cases themselves or are looking for pro bono work. And so I got involved volunteering with certain organizations, and then they added me to their referral list. Or, so I'll, I would say that for me personally, like 90% of my cases come from referrals. And so it's, and I would also say, um, you know, maybe find someone in your practice area that's solo, but maybe does something slightly different than what you do. Like, for instance, if within immigration, there's a lot of diversity, and so there might be getting a lot of phone calls. You know, the business immigration attorney might be getting phone calls, but he doesn't do deportation defense, or he doesn't do this. So then he might then refer those cases to you and vice versa. So I thought that was really helpful. Like, I get a lot of cases from someone that does something different than I, but gets a lot of phone calls. Um, and. I agree, like your family and friends and business associations, I go to conferences and oftentimes they have networking panels for solo attorneys where you can all meet and talk about you know, what you're doing, but they might live in Sacramento and they're getting calls for someone in San Francisco. So they're gonna remember you from the conference and they're gonna say, call this person. So I think that you know, there's many different ways to go about it. You could just be living your life naturally and just constantly people might be sort of, once they know that you do something, 
you know, wherever I go, I feel like I'm constantly running into people who need the type of work that I do. So it's just sort of, I don't really get a separation in my life from it, but it's fine because I love it. So <laughs> that's sort of, you know, you're always on in a way. And to, uh, to add to what you're saying, um, and the advice about just be yourself, if you're, you are who you are, and if you can be a resource both for your clients and also for the people who are in your network, that will really, really help. So people that you know, your colleagues, your business partners, anybody really that you meet, if you can be helpful to them, they like to reciprocate. And so they will help you out and you'll be you know, in their heads if there's a client or a potential case or even if they just have a question. And they say, they might just call you and say, hey, I know that you don't practice this area, but do you know someone who does that? And if you can help them and be that kind of resource, um, you'll get that back in droves and people will re start referring you cases. So, you know, I think that in terms of, you know, being, um, you know, being introverted or extroverted, as long as you don't isolate, <laughs> a lot, and you'll, you will come across in, you know, in the, in the legal profession, there are some solos who open a solo practice because they really want to be by themselves. And, um, but for the, and, and you, you will come across that. But for the most part, if you can, you know, get to know other people, get to know colleagues, it will really help. It's great because if you have a question, that will be a resource for you, whether it be substantive or business-wise, it will be really helpful. And if you can be helpful back, it will come back to you. That's really helpful. So the next thing I want to talk about is substantive knowledge. So obviously it's important to know your subject area. <coughs> Um, but if you're starting out right out of law school or fairly soon out of law school, I mean, what, what did you do, how did you get the, the resourcefulness to find the answers? And, and it, I guess it goes a little bit down, back to confidence, too. How did you get, how did you actually find the answers? Maybe I should ask Jody this. How did you find the answers? You knew that you could work, you could find some of them when you were at the firm, but you must have run across issues that you were like, oh my god, I don't know what I'm doing. So how did you sort of find something in yourself to figure out yeah. what to do? So I, that's true. Like I definitely felt like, even procedurally, like I didn't really know what I needed to do. I would, so it really depended on what the situation was. If I felt like comfortable emailing a mentor or a friend that had done something similar, I would. But you don't want to be calling that person. You don't want to become a leech onto your mentors or your friends. Like, so I, I joined um, the professional organization, and they had like a new members division as well. So I kind of spread out who I was asking. You know, for the things I would call the court sometimes, I would say, I'm a new attorney. I know this might be a silly question, but you know, I would talk to the clerks at the window at the court and just make sure I said, you know, I just want to make sure this is right. Or if they had said something was wrong, I would really try to understand what exactly was wrong. Um, there's practice manuals, so like for my practice area, I got the practice manuals, they're online oftentimes, so you don't need to buy it, um, but I really needed to have, so I found that I could find, ultimately, um, I could also post to, my professional organization had a forum that you could post to on the wall of this website where people would get back to you, so between all those different resources, I did feel like I could ultimately find it, and if I couldn't through that, I realized that there just was no answer out there sometimes. Like if you were trying to do something that was really novel and you would just sort of have to go into court and the judge, you know, I've had times where the judge has said, well, I've never heard this before. Like, I don't know what we'll do here, you know? And <laughs> it's just kind of like, okay, well, what are we gonna do? So I think that you just have to realize that if you've exercised, you know, really do your research though. Like my professional forum, they would yell at you on the wall if you posted a question that had already been previously answered. So I'd always say, I did all my homework, I looked at everything I could, and I still can't find this, can someone please help me? And 90% of the time, you know, someone would get back to me and sometimes they would say, you know, there's really no clear answer on this. And, you know, at a certain point you just have to realize that there really is not an exact answer out there and, you know, it's a living practice and you're gonna just, you can admit in court, you know, that you know you've looked into this and you're still unclear. And the judge will often, I think that all people will respect you if you sort of are really honest about it. Um, and you know, you're going to make mistakes, but that's sort of a part of being human. And I feel like if you do your research, you're not going to make like a horrible mistake that's going to be a malpractice mistake. It's just going to be sort of something small. So I think that's a part of the practices. But then you learn from your mistake. I mean, I went into court and the judge said, "You are familiar with this." 
And I sort of said, well, I am now. <laughs> so, I mean, you're going to have those moments. It's only natural. I think even if you were at a big firm and you were doing something, your mentoring attorney there might start to tell you. But, you know, you're going to come back and say, this is what happened. And you're going to learn from it. So, I think it's only natural that as a newer attorney or a newer in a practice area, there's going to be things that you're going to kind of be exposed to that you're just going to make some mistakes, but it's okay. Yes? Remember also, if you do get a paying client or a contingency fee case that has value, you can associate in more experienced counsel to help you out and to share the fees. And if you're doing most of the hard day-to-day -day work and they're really acting as an advisor, uh, you're not going to have to give them that much of the fee and they're going to help you out and be happy to do it. Well, now, that's a, a perfect answer to kind of go into the next question I had is um, financial concerns. Um, and, and we're going to go over sort of what you should think about in terms of business plans and things like that later. But this is more, you know, how do you keep from, from worrying about the, the finances, especially when you're, when you're starting a, a, a new practice? Um, and you know, what... <laughs> What can you do so that these financial concerns don't zap all your energy and you're really able to focus more on your on your practice and not so much on, you know, I don't have any funds coming in and this and that. Um, and how would you be sort of monetarily cautious and disciplined um, about it? Um, and I think I'll, well, I'll start with Carolyn because... Sure. Yeah. Um, well, back in the day, the conventional wisdom, you know, before the economy tank was that you would save up for three months of expenses before you even would open your doors. And the reality is right now, um, at least from a lot of the new attorneys that I've been talking to, there are a lot of attorneys who are starting right now without having that savings and because the, econ the market is not, you know, hasn't been so favorable for new attorneys in, in some of the big firms. Um, so a lot of people are going solo right now and there are um, without having three months worth of savings. And I think that financial concerns are always going to be there. Even if you're really, really profitable and productive and established, you're still going to have, you know, those financial concerns. <coughs> Where's the next case coming from? Um, <clears throat> in terms of being a new solo, there's a lot of ways that you can save money. Um, Janet mentioned, you know, doing an office share. Office shares will also sometimes lead to overflow work, which is really great. Um, a lot of um, solos are also working out of their houses, and you can do that by um, <clears throat> things like um, Regis spaces or temporary office spaces, great places where you can meet clients, um, places like liquid space, you know, you can get out of the house and actually, you know, do your work. So, I mean, I think that it's always gonna be a concern, you know, the financial concern is always gonna be there, but I think that there's been a little bit of a shift in the way that solos are practicing now and that you don't necessarily have that, you know, bank roll of three months worth of costs um, in the bank before you even start your practice. So, I mean, I think that once you do get started, you know, make sure that you are saving money, spending as little as possible on overhead, sharing costs with other attorneys is great in a shared space. Um, <coughs> making sure you bill your clients regularly is also helpful, and you might laugh, but there are a lot of attorneys that don't bill their clients monthly. Um, and so, you know, just making sure that you, um, that you are cutting your overhead costs as much as possible. And then, as much as it seems um, sort of counterintuitive, definitely hire a bookkeeper or have somebody help you with the books so that you have an objective person looking at them. It's really, really important. So, um, yeah, money will always be a concern, but I think that there are ways of minimizing costs when you're a new solo that would be helpful. I would say uh, make sure you have some your idea of how you're going to secure your business and you're starting to get some business before you start spending significant money. You can have a pretty cool looking presence with a, with a graphic design and a logo and a website that makes it look like you're a pretty uh, substantial law firm uh, without having office space and a lot of extra expenses and once you find out how that business is going to come in the door and you have a few cases <coughs> then you can start to spend a little money <clears throat> in terms of your in your office space or whatever. So much of that is, is cheaper than when I started. 
the office space I think was more expensive than it is now because of the opportunities Carolyn talked about with liquid space and rocket space and neck space and you know, uh, office shares like Janet started out with. So make sure you got your theory on how you're getting business in <coughs> going before you start spending significant money. And do all of you kind of, do you put a certain amount in reserve so that you save it for a rainy day when things are slow and so you don't worry? I would, I'd be the kind of person that would sit up all night and worry about, you know, do I have enough and what's going to happen if I have a low period? And so since I just completed, like, this past year was my first, like, full, full year of finishing and, you know, I had, I'd said been open for a year and a half, a little over that. And so I paid myself a set amount every month. Um, which was probably lower than what I should have paid myself, but then at the end of the year, I had a considerable surplus that I was like, oh, bonus. <laughs> so I would say that even when you see money coming in, you still like should be prepared. You know, you don't really always know what's going to happen next. So I definitely felt like I was really like disciplined and like I paid myself a set amount every month, and no matter what was happening with my business, I still paid the same amount. Um, something that I knew was viable. So I think that really helped. And so then at the end of the year, instead of paying it all out to myself, like I set aside some for savings, and also like I had to take care of my taxes. So you know, you are gonna have to think of those things because when you're paying yourself every month, you're not paying any taxes out of that initially. So those are things that you do need to set aside. And I mean, um, kind of based on what Carolyn was saying, you know, I do think having a bookkeeper or someone that can help you, because I was really freaked out about taxes. And then finally, at the end of the year, I met with someone, and it, like, it was actually like the worry and the stress about it was so much worse than what the actual reality of it was. It was like I would be constantly like nervous about it. And then when I sat down and actually like looked at the figures, I was like, oh, I don't know why I was so worried about that. So I often think that the worry about things is worse than actually like facing what you're worried about. Um, and just be realistic. I mean, I think that, you know, you just sort of money-wise, you can have an office in many different locations. I mean, my office is in an old converted warehouse with like brick walls. It's not the typical sort of sky rise in downtown. And I was a little bit, <coughs> like I have startup neighbors, and I was a little bit concerned what my clients were gonna think. And every client that has walked in has told me how much they love my office. So it's the t untypical office space, so you don't need to you know, go buy, go rent something on market, or you just need to sort of think about like what you can afford, what works for you, and what's going to be sort of viable for your practice. And if I could add one more thing, um, great comments as well. But when you are setting up, make sure that you're charging adequately, um, and that, and even if you're, you know, maybe absorbing a few hours of your own for research or things like that. Um, Make sure that your hourly rate is is on par, you know, with the market and what other people are charging. Um, I know that um, I've worked with a couple of new solos who are out for about a year, and the two that I'm thinking of in particular are charging well below market rate. And with the idea of like, well, I shouldn't be charging so much. I'm a new attorney. I don't have the experience yet, and so I'm going to make up for it by only charging $100 an hour. And and while I understand that. That's, um, it's still, I think it's a little bit demoralizing. Um, and it will, if anything's gonna suck your energy out, I think it's you know not really getting paid. I mean, you've, you've gone to law school, you've passed the bar, you know, you're paying for the education, you're an attorney, you're a licensed attorney, so charge you know on par with the market, even if you do maybe knock off some hours, if you feel like you're not up to speed in a certain area, or it's a novel issue, or it's maybe a new kind of a case. Um, make sure that you're charging adequately for your time because you do deserve it and it will, it'll just help keep you motivated to keep practicing. And just to add to what Carolyn says, I actually have had the experience of having a client, a potential client not hire me because my rate was too low and thinking that, well, if you're only going to charge me this and so-and-so is charging that, they must be a better lawyer. So don't sell yourself short. Uh, that was a, that was a shocking lesson for me to learn, and I, I pass it on to you. Don't sell yourself short. I'm I'm going to shift a little here. I'm going to I want to ask about business knowledge. So, um, how important is it to have some basic business knowledge, and specifically in what? And how did you go about obtaining that? And um, maybe I'll start with Jody. 
<laughs> well, I would say I started with like very little business knowledge, unfortunately. I mean, I kind of was, I didn't really like that I was wearing two hats initially. I really wanted to focus on the law and it took me a little while to sort of realize that I really needed to be focusing on these other business aspects as well. And so, I mean, <coughs> Like, even just basic things, like I didn't have a, a solid payment plan system set up for a little while with my clients. They were sort of all on post-it notes all over my <laughs> office. And so, I mean, I would say that those types of things, like making sure that you're getting paid and making sure that your clients know their expectation and making sure that's all communicated and in writing, because at first I was just very, oh, we'll just figure it out as it goes. And that doesn't really work as far as getting yourself paid. Um, so I definitely think that I probably could have benefited from having had that skill a little earlier. Um, I feel like I got, and I got lucky, I got an intern that was an MBA um, in my office and she sat down and got everything going on Excel. Um, so I think that's something that, you know, I think you do need to recognize your weaknesses and, you know, maybe get outside help when you need it because there's areas like with bookkeeping or accounting or your taxes and just your just basics of your business that you may not actually know and I think you need to recognize when it's time to get help um, because you may not be even though you're great at the law and you're great at many things you may not be great at every aspect of your business but you need to at least have all your bases covered so. yes yeah. this is super super important and uh, you do have to pay attention to the business side of it I think many people may think, well, I'm a lawyer, I'm into the law, and that's what I'm focusing on is just the law, but that's really maybe 10 to 20% of it. Uh, a good book out there to read is uh, by Michael Gerber called The E-Myth Lawyer. His first book was The E-Myth, and then he went and did it for different professions. You really have to think in terms of systems, how to have a even just a system for building relationships and networking. That's a system, a payment system, as Jody talked about. For years, as a contingency fee lawyer, I uh, wondered about my profit margin <laughs> in certain cases. And finally, after being in practice for 15 years, I hired somebody that showed me how to calculate our profit margins on cases. And it's been invaluable to figuring out the cases where we can actually make money and the cases that we don't because we're all contingency fee based. Uh, for years I didn't keep our time, but then starting in 2006 we built into our database ability to keep time even though again we're contingency fee lawyers and that's a business solution that has just paid dividends. So yes, those now you have your JD you and go get your MBA and then open your <laughs> practice. <laughs> Um, to add to what Al was saying, um, when I was practicing, I did immigration law and in, in the, and I did removal defense. And sort of the, the common um, method is to do flat fee. Mm -hmm. And so we would charge flat fee, and honestly, a lot of times I would pick numbers out of the air. I'm like, well, I think this is going to be kind of a tough case, so it'll be this much. <laughs> and we incorporate it into, uh, um, into our into the, uh, retainer agreement. and then. A few years before I closed, I actually started tracking the amount of time that it took to do those cases. And you know, they were the courts were backed up at the time, so there's two court hearings in immigration law, a master calendar and an individual hearing. Master calendars are supposed to be shorter, but sometimes we were there all morning or all afternoon. So four hours for the master, four hours for an individual, there's eight hours right there. We're preparing the application, you can add a couple more hours at least there. There's preparing the client, doing the research, writing the brief. We're up to about 15 hours. And if I'm charging, and at the time, I mean, I know it's low, but in immigration, about 250 an hour, I mean, you do the math, and you're starting to get up there in fees. I think when I did, when I finally crunched the numbers on it, my hourly rate was coming out to something like $75 an hour. So it's a good idea, you know, when you do have these systems, to periodically check in with them, test and measure the results so that you know okay, I'm, I'm, I'm spending this much on a case and it might be a flat fee, maybe you're writing a will or a trust and you only want to charge this much because that's what they do, but find out how much you know, things cost and 
for all of your systems and it will be you know informative for you and it will help you better utilize all of your resources whether it be time money energy lawyering marketing whatever it is so I would just I found that was really helpful too Okay, that's good. But um, I think I was going to ask something about being a small business owner and, and, and how people adapted to wearing all the different hats that you must have to wear. And because and, um, you're really you're running the office, you're an HR director if you bring somebody in to do whatever. Um, you have business development and marketing, and, and you're you know going to be xeroxing copies of things. So, um, what you know what, what you know how did you adapt to this? And you think there's a certain personality trait you need? I mean, you've all done well at it. So, is it just being really really open to you know and, and not having a huge ego that you know you're in your own practice, you can do everything, then that's fine. So, I'll kind of leave it open yeah, to you. Yeah. How would you? <laughs> I, I think for me it helped that I wasn't leaving, um, like I had started fairly soon out of school and so I didn't have that sort of mentality of there was any job that was sort of beneath me. Um, and not that people that necessarily have been practicing for a long time have that mentality, but I wasn't used to an assistant. I wasn't used to someone else doing things yet for me. So I think that was sort of helpful, like that, and to this day, I mean, I still, don't mind doing any of the projects. I have interns, um, either law students or perhaps people who are in college who are doing things for like academic credit, and so I'm able to delegate some things to them, but I don't really want to delegate like purely administrative stuff to people who I'm supposed to be giving a learning experience to. So even if I have interns, I'm often doing the photocopying myself um, and the types. So I think it's a matter of just like understanding that it's your business and you know there's really no task that's beneath you and you know things need to get done and whatever needs to get done you know you sort of just have to be willing to do it but I think when it's your own practice it doesn't really like at least for me it doesn't feel annoying or like I just kind of think it's just like another part of my day and so it's sort of trying to delegate your day and your time to doing all the things that you need to do like you know scheduling okay this is when I'm going to do my billing this is when I'm going to do this so it's sometimes just I find I don't often get as much accomplished as I hope to because I have all these different tasks that you know I have to go to FedEx and I have to go do this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's just also sort of being realistic with yourself and until you get, maybe you do get help at some point. I think that is, I think I'm at the point where I'm ready to actually hire someone, but that's like exciting that I'm actually viable and able to probably like hire some part-time help so that I can delegate. I don't need to answer every phone call or, and I guess you don't need to answer your phone every time it rings, but I always feel like it's a potential client, and now I'm beginning to say, like, after seven or after a certain time, they can leave a message. Um, so I don't, because then if you answer your phone call at, like, 11 p.m., then your client's going to think that you're available at 11 every night. And so I don't want to, like, set unhealthy practices for my clients to, like, allow them to call me at five in the morning or two in the morning, which they have. So I think you just need to, like, turn your phone off at a certain point and, walk away from your office at a certain time because the problem with being a solo is it's you and it follows you and you think about it even when you're not there. So I feel like you're not, even if you keep 40 hours, which most of you won't, you're still thinking about it when you're in the shower and when you're driving. And So I think at a certain point you just need to try to turn it off and try to live your life and have that balance. Um, I think that um, in addition to those points, just know yourself. I know that when I was practicing, um, the stuff that I didn't want to do, you know, in terms of, you know, the business parts of it, just wouldn't get done. And, you know, and so those were the things that I tended to procrastinate the most. Those were the things that would just stack up in my inbox. And so those were the, those were the prime things to delegate. <laughs> and um, so really know yourself and know what your limitations are going to be. There's only so many hours in the day. And so that's, you know, if you're sort of noticing, it's like, hey, I'm not really getting around to doing that bookkeeping, or I'm not really getting around to writing those email newsletters, those might be really great areas to, um, to ask someone else to help with an intern or, you know, a contract person. Um, and that, that goes for even, you know, substantive areas too, you know, um, but especially with, this, with the business side of things, these are some, stuff, some things that really need to get done in order for your business to thrive. 
And if you're anything like me, I, it just wouldn't get done if I, it was something I didn't like to do. Like, uh, <clears throat> the, the, um, the admin part of it, you're going to do it all at the beginning. You're going to open your mail, go to the FedEx drop-off, but you want to set goals and eliminate those responsibilities. Create job descriptions for the FedEx drop or the mail opening and calendaring and slowly begin to fill those with positions, uh, as Jody's about to, it sounds like. Because you want to be working at the highest possible level given your experience and training and making important legal decisions and analysis and client contact and decision making because that's where you're most suited to be most useful. We're not trained to drop off FedEx packages. <clears throat> so you really want to slowly try to delegate that otherwise it will hold you back. And there was a, a period in my career where that definitely held me back. Um, not delegating that stuff. Janet, did you have any additional? Um, I, I think uh, everybody has uh, had very it. good, yeah, yeah, very good. W one thing I would say in, in response to what Jody says, I, I think as a small business owner, you really need to define for your client um, what your availability is. Uh, Jody says she uh, answers her phone at 11 o'clock. Not anymore. <laughs> I, uh, I would not. If my client were to call me at home, I would be very annoyed and I would let them know that that is unacceptable and possibly I ought to charge them double just for having them. I mean, I, I, I set limits with my clients because <coughs> clients are needy. They need you. And you need to um, have your own life, and you can't be available to your clients 24 hours. If you do, you're 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 probably not serving your clients, and you're certainly not serving yourself. So, um, you know, I I think one of the most important things for my business is having someone answer my phone. I I always have had a office space where I've had a receptionist. Having a receptionist is you know, it's, it's very worth it to me because that receptionist will uh, <coughs> figure out whether it's a sales call um, and let me know, oh, it's a sales call, do you want to take it? No, I'm not available. Or if uh, somebody who has, you know, I can refuse a call, know that they're there, put them in voicemail, I can deal with them later. And my voicemail goes on, you know, at 5.30 or 6 o'clock whenever I leave the office, so I don't have to answer those phones. So I, I think that is important that you let your clients know that you're a business, but you're not in business 24 hours a day. <coughs> well, that's, that's, that's really helpful. So you really have to set limits. That's a good Absolutely. attribute to have. I have one more question, and then we're going to have a quick um, five-minute Q&A. Um, when I was reading one of the resources, and by the way, we have on the resource table, we have both resources to help give you um, more things to read and look at in terms of not only a solo legal practice, but also the business side of things. Um, so I wanted to mention that. But but in reading those materials, one thing that came up um, over and over again was the support of friends and family. And I wanted you all to speak a little bit to that. Um, it especially came up like when you're starting it, just you know, because you, you will have a lot of moments of feeling things are unpredictable and needing confidence and all that kind of thing. So. I thought if you could each address that really quick and then we'll do a question and answer. I think for me personally, um, you know, I my father had his own practice, so in that sense, like, I was fortunate that I came from a family where law is, you know, normal. And um, I think, you know, I had a lot of support initially because I, was, I wasn't sure when when this office space kind of got offered to me, I said, oh, but I'm not, I said, this would be great if it came up in a few months, but I'm not ready. And then um, both my father and my husband were sort of like, well, why not? Like, just try it. So I feel like, I think I kind of did need a little bit of push from family to sort of say, like, you know, just go for this. I think in some ways I was fortunate in that, you know, I wasn't leaving, like, a great job. Like, I was sort of piecing together contract work. So it wasn't like I was walking away from anything super stable. And so I think I, think I needed a little bit of a push because um, it is a little scary, you know, you're suddenly taking on this whole 
thing, and it's it's going to be you. Um, so I think that family support is incredibly important. I think it just, you know, like with with many things in life, you know, like if you have people around you supporting you in it, you feel better about it. And but even without it, I think, you know, I I definitely think it was a huge impact on me starting my practice personally. Um. I just think it's super important, and you know, there's always going to be probably one or two people that say, why don't you just get a job, you know, and easier said than done sometimes, and also if you're really passionate about starting your own practice, and which is definitely, there are a lot of upsides to it. So as Al brought up before, self-talk, you know, keep that going, and also let just letting, you know, people that are in your, you know, your circle of friends and family know that, hey, this is really important to me, and I appreciate your support around it. Um, it's just really, you know, it helps as another motivating factor, at least that's what I if you don't have the support of your friends and family, you can still do it yourself. And my father uh, was in a solo practice, not an attorney, and he was like, don't go into solo <laughs> private practice. That's it's way too hard. Get a government job. <laughs> I didn't take his advice, maybe wrongly, uh, but I can tell you the benefits of solo practice are, uh, for me, you don't have a boss, and that is like I think maybe one of the overriding uh, <clears throat> ideas that so many of us like. Uh, you get to make your own mistakes. You get to pick those clients and those cases that interest you and, and that you will have a passion for. And some of them will turn out wrong. But those are your mistakes, not the mistake of some other lawyer who picked that case because they thought they saw you know golden dollars in front of them and then passed it on to you as an associate and then you're stuck with this either unreasonable client or unwinnable case. So the idea that you get to direct your future, um, I think that is something that keeps all of us solos in solo practice. So I guess we're ready for Q&A. So I know you had a question, you're yes. going to ask. Um, it's a question about wearing the different hats. And I'm actually in my first year of practice, and I've found that not only are you a business owner, not only are you a lawyer, not only are you a counselor to your clients and a boss to your employees, you're also a collection agent. And that's probably the hardest part of it for me so far, and I'm wondering if I can hear from the older members of the panel about how they've developed their practice to deal with collecting from their clients. Well, I want to say first, we are going to go, we have a whole section on that later, but go ahead and answer the question. <laughs> collections are hard. Uh, <laughs> 30 years out, collections are still hard, and uh, there are some people you'll never collect from. Uh, you either have some, you know, you're, if you have a, a uh, administrative person or a secretary in your office, Sometimes you need to delegate it to them. I can tell you I, uh, I send out monthly bills. I get the sob story, oh Janet, um, you know, my mother has heart surgery, my, you know, I gotta pay my taxes, I just had Christmas, I got all these bills. It's really hard to collect and I have certainly had a lot of accounts receivable. So sometimes you just need to bite the bullet and uh, try to collect through suing them. Um, you know, small claims court, go to uh, the Bar Association, San Francisco Bar Association. They have, you have uh, mediation services with your clients to see if they can resolve uh, your bill. Be willing to deal. It's getting something is better than getting nothing. Um, as, a, as a tip, uh, the statute of limitations on suing a lawyer for malpractice is a year from the time you, your services end or that they end knowing you, but your um, term, time to collect on a written contract is four years. 
So sometimes <laughs> it might be just worth your while to sort of sit back and then um, let that year pass. <laughs> because you can be certain that when you get a, a, a fee dispute, uh, you may, be, uh, may face the idea that you were an incompetent attorney and that's why they're not going to get um, just, uh, it'll be brought up later, I'm sure, but as much as you can, cash up front, uh, <laughs> as, as much as you can. Yeah. But in other cases, just like with other office procedures and policies, make sure it's a process. And so, you know, whether you're taking care of it or you have an admin, you know, monthly billing, definitely um, refresh those retainers. And um, then also, you know, know when the, when the Dunning letter comes out know when the, you know, when the sort of the, the more, the sterner Dunning letter is going to come out. <clears throat> so that there's a system. And also, um, what I've also found helpful is to have some sort of either interest or late fee or whatever, because if a client or a, a, if a client's looking at, you know, a credit card bill versus our bill, and the credit card is going to accrue interest and our bill is not, you know, I found that my bill would go to the end of the pile because there's no penalty for charging for it being late. So, but whatever you do, have some sort of a process or procedure that you stick to. <coughs> uh, so I have a question with regards to uh, mm -hmm. delegating duties and setting limitations uh, with your clients. Uh, I personally subscribe to the old adage of, if you want something done right, just do it yourself. And I think almost to my detriment <laughs> at some point. So uh, do you ever have uh, like trust issues <laughs> as far as, you know, having your receptionist take calls or having an assistant uh, communicate with clients, is that just something that you just have to kind of learn to just get over and, and let go at some point in regards to trusting somebody else to, you know, when you spend all this time, you know, bringing in clients or nurturing the relationship and then just handing it off to somebody else. For me, it's, you know, that's something that's really difficult to do. Is to, you know, like what, letting the phone ring at 9 p.m. when I know a client is calling and I'm just not to be able to go in the morning. Sometimes it's easier to just give in and answer the phone right then and, and talk to them. Well. I think as far as like delegating, I mean, I think that you're delegating, but you're not like completely walking, over, like you're still keeping an eye on it. So I think it's just, you know, knowing the people, like for instance, if I give an intern in my office a project to write a brief, I might have it, but I'm gonna make sure that the deadline that they're gonna give it to me is well enough time that if I need to change a lot, like there's gonna be plenty of time. So I would say just be like really reasonable with yourself and how much time, like, you know, you're going to delegate something, but you also need to be realistic to keep an eye on it, that you're not going to want to let just a project go off and then not check up on it and then suddenly have it be due because that's when you're going to be freaking out and meet <coughs> your expectations. So I would say, like, keep an eye on it. And hire people that are, like, if you're going to get someone, hire someone that you think is almost better than yourself if you can. Because, <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things that if you want people working with you, you want to try to have the absolute best. Um, so sometimes it's not worth it if you think, oh, this person's working for me for free. They may not actually be doing you that much of a service. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want to keep an eye on it. And, you know, if that phone call goes to voicemail, you can always call and listen in on it. And if it's not urgent, you know, there's nothing that you can probably do at that time as a lawyer anyway for the most part. Mm -hmm. So it's just learning to sort of, like, let go at a certain point and to keep an eye on things and not to completely delegate everything out. Mm -hmm. You have to systematize it too, and it's really the it's really gonna really hurt you long term if you have a hard time letting go. You just that's what the E myth talks about. So if you have a receptionist, you have to create a system and tell him here are all the categories of calls. Here's what you do if it's a prospect or a new client. Here's what you do if it's a defense attorney. If the court calls, here's what you do. You notify me immediately. And you just have a system uh, for how to deal with all the different scenarios. And when you really start to look at it, it's really all of our work is so repetitive. And it's just repetitive stuff. And you flow chart it and systematize it. And then you have to let go of it. Otherwise, um, you're going to be overwhelmed and you're going to be working seven days a week. But it's still interesting and challenging, even though it's <laughs> So I think I think we're going to need to wrap this up. But we will have the half hour at the end if people have more questions, and um, we're going to move to the next panel. So.
hope everyone enjoyed the first session and we'll return. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm Suzanne Aronowitz. It's nice to see so many familiar faces around the room. Good morning. Uh, this next session, we're going to focus on logistics. We actually have two logistics panels. This is part one. Uh, and so we'll, we'll sort of build on some of the topics that were raised by the earlier panel and, and start diving into some of the nitty gritty. Uh, and most of the panelists here started their practice either immediately upon graduation or soon thereafter. And so for a lot of you who are relatively recent graduates, I think that will help, uh, they'll have a similar perspective perhaps to what you're going through now and some of the choices that you made to get started rather than what do you need to do five years in, 10 years in, but really what do you need to do to, to get off the ground? Uh, so I'll just briefly introduce their names in case you can't uh, read the signs. Uh, right next to me is Ruth Kalnitsky. Uh, next to her is Jody Santiago. You heard from Jody in the last hour. Uh, next to Jody is Alan Baer, and next to Alan is Heather Borlace. And all their bios are in the materials we gave you so you can learn more about them, and you'll be hearing more about them as they speak. So we want to start at the beginning, which, um, I suppose if we're doing things right is starting with a business plan and uh, which isn't always how people start uh, sometimes you jump in and develop the plan later but I'm curious uh, if any of the panelists actually started with a business plan uh, and what were some of those elements that uh, you put into it in terms of projecting what your business is going to be and who your clients were going to be and how you were going to find them and what things might cost you and you know and sort of what were those basic elements and, and uh, before they speak I do want to make sure you uh, you pick up some of the materials we have at the handout table the, there are some materials uh, that pertain specifically to business planning uh, the law uh, I'm sorry the University Library pulled together <coughs> some materials for us including some websites some workshops some uh, other materials books uh, and resources that can help with much uh, greater detail and, and where you can tailor things to your particular needs. Uh, we also have information from the Renaissance Center, which is a whole um, entrepreneurship resource and a business incubator, and they have a lot of programs and resources as well. Uh, anyone? Did any of you actually have a business plan when you started? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did. I got one. Okay. So I've actually done this whole starting a solo practice or small practice thing twice. And the first time it was law offices Ruth Kalnitsky and I sort of announced by email that I had a shingle and would take almost any case that came in through the door as long as mm -hmm. I thought it sounded like fun and it would pay bills. And I didn't have a plan and I didn't really, I kind of planned as I went along and that was working okay, but then I met another attorney who I decided to partner with, and in contemplation of forming, forming this partnership, we created a business plan. And we spent months sitting there and figuring out where we wanted to be in a year, in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, and how we were gonna go about all of the things we wanted to do, and really planned it all out and created a good roadmap of where we needed to go from the point of forming the partnership forward. And we adjusted, but it, we found it very helpful to have sort of an agreement before we launched on this big project of forming this very niche practice and, you know, moving forward we're all, like, things change, plans change, the plan changes, but we have a good solid basis to move forward from. And in doing this twice, I would highly recommend having a plan because you never really reach a point where you're like, okay, <coughs> what do I do now? Like, it's already planned for, if you hit a wall and you don't really remember what you were gonna do, you just go back to this piece of paper that you drafted and see if that's still what you need to do or if you need to make adjustments. So it's, it's a good thing to do. Were there um, resources that you found to be particularly helpful in forming them? No. <laughs> We're very honest here. <laughs> we copied a business plan template from the internet. It was probably for a startup, like a dot-com company, and we just cut pieces out that didn't seem relevant to us. Like, we're not really selling anything. We're selling a service, so we didn't really need the parts of, like, how much is manufacturing is going to cost, and, you know, who are we going to hire? We weren't really going to hire anybody. So we just cut out the parts that seemed irrelevant and made up categories that we thought would be important, like billable hours versus flat fee, and figured out what is relevant to us in our business and lawyering in general and went from there. Any of you um, have one now or, or wish you had? <laughs> yeah, pieces of one, yeah. I think. Um, I bought a book uh, about five years ago on how to write a business plan. <laughs> <laughs> it looks really good. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I opened right after I passed the bar and kind of opened in the back half of my living room. My 
my big business plan was how do I buy a computer that will serve all my needs and get a website up. And once I had those two things nailed down, I was done. So I just started trying to get cases. And um, we've moved in different directions since then now in my practice together. Um, and the business has gotten a lot more complicated and you know, a, a lot more formal. So now we're working on like an advertising aspect of the business plan. No, we never really sat down and did that. But I, I will say that the most important thing that I can think of in setting it up is making sure that you understand what your expenses are going to be. So at least map out how much everything is going to cost. And when you're doing that, throw everything you can possibly think of in the mix to see, you know, kind of what your big budget would be. And then you can pare it down from there. So that kind of includes all the advertising and anything else you can think of that's going to go into it. So make sure you know what all those expenses are. The, the first panel talks about having whatever money you can saved up. You know, the worst thing to do is to say, okay, I've got three months expenses, get into it and understand you have about three weeks expenses. Mm -hmm. So you know, to the best you can, understand what all of those expenses are going to be ahead of time. Can you um, highlight maybe some of those hidden expenses that folks, wouldn't occur to folks, you know, anything from filing fees to you know, your website domain name registration, or you know, what are, what are some of the things that we really need to keep in mind? Um, depending on the kind of life practice professional membership expenses can be, yeah. you know, thousands of dollars every year. Um, people expect that because you're an attorney that you make money hand over fist and they all want to get a piece of that. And um, yeah, monthly dues or, or yearly memberships can, can run. Um, I think ours run close to 10,000. Mm -hmm. Just basic stuff. And on that, like I found that like professional memberships, some of them have payment plans. Like they don't advertise, but if you talk to the people there, like they'll let you pay quarterly instead of having to pay the full membership due up front. So that was something that helped me personally because initially I knew I wanted to join certain organizations, but I was sort of floored by how expensive it was, especially just starting up. That I felt like they were taking all my money. Um, but you know. And conferences, those all things add in that, you know, getting your CLEs and doing everything ends up being an extra cost. So I think that's, for me, it wasn't a business plan, but it was sort of like maintaining a certain budget for myself of, you know, how much, even if I was taking in a lot more money than what I was paying myself, sort of setting money aside because, you know, as you grow, you're going to take on probably more expenses and you may eventually want to move. So just sort of being realistic and sort of looking at, 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 after a year maybe, like sitting down and saying, well, what were my expenses every month? Or even sooner than that. But sort of saying, like, what are my expenses and how am I going to grow? So that would be a good thing to do. Library costs. Mm -hmm. Not only getting the practice guys and the <coughs> Lexus for Westlaw access, but all the updates and all the little things that can get, it up, get added on to it. Oh, it would be good to have this. Well, how much does it cost? Oh, it costs how much? Well, do I really need it? So library costs are something that, that need to be well researched in terms of what do I actually need and what are the costs of it and what's it going to take to maintain it on an annual basis. And be vigilant with your contracts with um, Lexus and Westlaw. They will sell you a lot of things that in the beginning you may want to have because you feel like you, it's a nice safety net to have access to all that stuff. And then you realize, okay, I'm not really using the New Jersey practice guide. <laughs> <laughs> so eliminate that from my plan. Um, and, and, and be honest with them about the packages that they're providing you. Um, you might be able to tailor something and get something for lower than what they're offering you on the market plan. And, and your rep will actually appreciate the feedback and, and help you out. And the same thing goes for any advertising service provider. I feel like as soon as you open a practice, someone buys a list of all the new businesses that were registered in the last three months, and you're getting phone calls left and right from people who guarantee that they can triple your business in five minutes, and you only have to pay them like 350 bucks a month or whatever sum that they happen to be charging at that point. And at first, it seems really you know tempting to sign up with all of them because they're all making these huge promises, and it's really important to sort of keep in mind that they're you know they're salespeople, and you don't really know what service they're providing, and do your research before you commit to any advertising or marketing or networking online thing. Yeah, and I think something to keep in mind, is, as some of the panelists mentioned earlier, is 
yes, you need to think about advertising and you need to think about library resources and you need to think about memberships, but you may not need all of it at the beginning or there may be some very creative ways of finding those resources. So uh, when you mention library, you know, remember, especially those of you who are uh, very recent graduates, you have access to our law library for free for two years. And after that, the uh, membership cost, I think, is $25. So. Uh, at least to get access to the, the practice guides or, you know, the, the materials and, and the reference librarians who are worth uh, their weight in gold. You, you have access to those resources, and I think the more you talk to other colleagues, you can find some clever ways of doing this kind of on the cheap until you, you get yourself established. Bar associations, professional groups, you might figure out which are, which are the essentials and which are the ones I want to build in down the road. I want to, you know, by next year I want to have enough revenue that I can afford to join this group or that group. Um, I'm going to talk about firm name. That's also one of the things that, you know, okay, I'm in business. What is your business called? Uh, you know, lawyers tend not to be very creative uh, with their firm names for a variety of reasons. Um, your name is a little unusual. Not, you yep. know, so I was wondering if you could talk about how you came up with that and maybe some of the pros and cons of having a name that's, and maybe tell everyone what your practice name is. Sure. Uh, my practice is called ARCS. It's an acronym for Adoption and Assisted Reproduction Law Offices of Tolnitsky and Sadian. <laughs> we had to have an acronym. We both have complicated last names, and we do adoption and assisted reproduction law. It's all too big of a mouthful to say every time someone asks what my firm name firm name's called or you know, spelling out an email address. So we just turned it into an acronym. It's worked pretty well. Some people call us aardvarks. That's OK. <laughs> um, it, you know, in general, it's one syllable. It's, it's easy to get out of your mouth. And there are all sorts of rules and regulations about lawyer law firm names. And we hope we abided by all of them. We think we did. <laughs> so it's kind of it's kind of hard to come up with some, you know, random, catchy, clever name that you can use as a marketing employee. But we're going to use this for now. Yeah. I, I mine's basic and boring. It's just my last name. Um, and I had one former professor trying to tell me I should call myself Santiago and Associates, but I didn't have any associates. And so <laughs> I thought that that would constantly, I thought it was misleading. So um, I just thought, I mean, it's good because with my work I do immigration, and so people like that a lot of my clients are Latino, so they see I have a Latino last name. I think they're looking at me when they come in, and they're like, are you Latino? And I'm like, no, my husband. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or Filipino. They think I'm Filipino sometimes. They're a little disappointed. But um, once they're in, I, I captivate them. I try to keep them. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, you know, nothing too crazy, something that people are going to remember. Um, it's just, mine's just basic. Simple is best, particularly when thinking of websites and email addresses and finding it and making it easy for people to find. Simple is best. Maybe along the lines with firm name, that's often tied to sort of your business entity and what kind, you know, whether you're a partnership or some other entity. So I'm curious, sort of, what is your official business form um, that all of you have, and and did you have choices, and why did you make those the choice that you made? Um, we're an LLP. We did it because the tax structure and liability structure. I'm sure all of you guys remember corporations <coughs> class. Mm -hmm. Seemed like the best idea for the type of partnership we are. Um, no, go ahead. Oh, I'm a sole proprietorship, but I'm definitely thinking about changing it. It's just kind of what was easy <coughs> to get up and running um, under, like I just filed under my, so like everything was just very simple. Um, but now I'm beginning to rethink that after being sort of in business longer and wanting to protect my liability, so it might be shifting soon. We're a sole proprietorship. Yeah, I started as a sole proprietorship, and because we're married legally, we can maintain that mm -hmm. status, and we're also looking to kind of reconfigure that. And so, especially for those of you thinking of shifting, what advice would you have for, I mean, is that still what you'd recommend for someone, I want to become a solo practitioner on Monday, and that's the way to go, or is that, are they exposed to liability in a way that maybe they should consider? If you have assets, you're exposed to liability. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It's relative to that, and that's that's I think a primary consideration. And um, corporations was not my favorite class, so I'm really happy to sit here and tell you what the benefits of different uh, formats are. But that that was our decision, and it's been working for us. 
And mine was really similar. Um, it's so, I, I honestly haven't done, I mean, I'm in the process of sort of just researching the changes myself, so I don't feel comfortable telling people what I think is best yet. I mean, this was what was easiest to get up, running quickest, and the most, you know, and so far, I, I haven't had any problems, and, you know, I think it's, I think it's fine initially. I think it's just, you know, after you grow for a while, it's something, or maybe it's something that you don't want to do initially, but every, I spoke to tons of solos before I started in my particular field, and almost all of them were sole proprietorships, and, you know, got sort of their basic advice and what had worked for them. So I had modeled it sort of after other practices that I had witnessed. So a business license seems to me something that you might want to have, and <laughs> yeah. I imagine it's a very simple procedure. You, anyone, how long did it take to obtain your license, and how complicated is it? It's a couple hours. You just go to City Hall and yep. file some paperwork, and they tell you exactly what to do. There's a small business section where someone will sit down with you and walk you through the steps, and you're like, oh, really? It's this easy? I thought it was going to be a little bit more complicated, and you send in some forms, and you're done. And then you have to advertise. Well, you don't have to, but if you're, like, I thought, with my law office, since I wasn't <coughs> Jody Santiago, my business name had law office in it. I did advertise my business name. There was some debate about whether or not that was necessary, but you can register your business, like a fictitious business name. My bank required that I do that if I wanted to have, if I wanted to receive checks in anything other than just my name. And so I was, since my name is not Santiago Law Office, I had to, and I thought it was best, I mean, I think the expense of doing something that was like $60, you know, they give you a list of newspapers, City, um, City Hall did, and the recorder, I think it was, which was the legal newspaper, was the absolute cheapest, and it was like 60 bucks. So the whole registering business and business name, I think, was approximately $100, and then you pay um, every year to sort of renew your business license, but it's like $25 or $35. It's, if you don't have any employees, it's really, just not even really a cost. Well, speaking of the banking, then let me uh, follow up with that question in terms of what kind of bank accounts do you need? You need to have a client trust fund. You need to have an account for your expenses, and so sort of how did you set up your accounts? Um, what tools are you using to keep track of you know which expenses are coming in and, and fees coming in from different clients and really maintaining a handle because that is something you don't want to have get away from you. And so if there are, you know, do you find that your, your bank is helpful in that regard or were there other tools? No, I'm probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an optimist. Um, you know, or, or were there tools that you found to be particularly helpful because many of us, that's not the reason why we're going into practice to just look at spreadsheets all day and check our numbers. Um, it's been 10 years since I did this, but my recollection is that the State Bar has really good resources on setting up a client trust account. They want you to do it right. And one of the fastest ways to get a, an ethics complaint is to do it wrong. Um, you are required to have <clears throat> hard copy records for every client that has money in your client trust account, and um, to you know have those separated out, and as well as having a book for the entire account. If that makes sense, and uh, you have to you have to monitor that very carefully. Um, if you write a check that bounces from your client trust account. Um, the state bar has the power to uh, audit your accounts and they will get a report from you silently and they will get a report from your bank that you've bounced a client trust account check and you will have an investigation <coughs> opened on you like that. So um, you want to be real careful with that. They were talking about bookkeeping in the last uh, panel. I think we're going to be talking about it again. It's imperative for that account that you have someone that knows what they're doing or you have a dedicated amount of time or system in your office um, when you're dealing with other people's money. And uh, it's not hard, it's just something you gotta do, and you gotta do it right. And not every practice is necessarily, I mean, I have an IELTS account, but it has a sentiment. You know, so not, not every aspect of your practice is gonna be holding money and trust for people. I mean, for the most part, my practice doesn't really have that element of it really involved. So I set it up, and I've done one check for a client, but it may not, so I think it's important to investigate, you know, with your practice area, whether or not you're holding money and trust for clients. <coughs> um, 
So not every element of your practice will necessarily need it, but you definitely need to look into it. And my bank was super easy about setting it up. Like it took five minutes when I went in there. There was the business banking specialist, and he sat down with me and we set it up. The only frustrating thing is when I wrote my IELTS check, my bank refused to cash it because it was so big and it was the first check that they were freaked out. But um, other than that, um, I haven't had any issues with it. I haven't had any issues with my IELTS account. The bank was super helpful. There was one guy who's unfortunately no longer there who would like bend over backwards to help me do whatever I needed to do, which was never anything fancy, but he would like kick people out of his desk space when I walked into the bank. It was great. It's not really important for a while. <laughs> but the banks are generally pretty, pretty helpful. They'll tell you conflicting information sometimes. Like one woman at the bank offered me a debit card for my IOLTA account, and I was like, I don't think you can do that, but sure, you know. If you want to send me a debit card, you can. And I followed up two weeks later, and she was like, oh, sorry, I was, I was totally wrong. I can't send you one of those. <laughs> so you, if something doesn't make sense that they're saying you can do, you probably can't. They're not lawyers. <laughs> they're not the state bar. Just, you know, assume that people make mistakes and kind of double check their work. Right, well, because also at the end of the day, as Heather was saying, I mean, the, the stakes, especially here, are quite high. And so yeah. you don't want to trust that somebody in the bank said so just because they say so. Well, the banks are thoroughly confused about IOTAs. Yeah. Yeah. They, they do them so rarely in their overall business, they're just completely confused about them. So you better know what you're doing as opposed to expecting them to know what they're doing. Um, the prior panel talked a little bit about um, the location in which you work, and, and so we'll talk about that a bit, because there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, you know, you, you know, perhaps I don't know, maybe you need this much, you know, you need a desk or, or a place to work. Um, and for some of us, you know, working out of the house may be initially the easiest way to do it. Uh, but there are, you may need other services and resources through a location. You may need a, pl a place to meet your clients. You might need a place to use library resources. You might need a place to uh, post a deposition or negotiate with opposing counsel. Uh, you might want to see an, another human at some point during the day or, or have colleagues or, or get cases referred to you or you know have that person down the hall that you can chat with. Uh, you don't necessarily have to satisfy all of those things with the same space. And, and so in the beginning, you may need to be a little bit more flexible and that may be a way to make it financially viable. Uh, but I, I'm curious, um, you know, some of the panelists earlier talked about some of their Options. I know um, when Heather started, as you mentioned earlier, you started out of your house. Uh, and so how did you handle the sort of the public facing portion dealing with clients? Did you invite them into the back half of your living room? And <laughs> no, um, and if you choose to have a home office, um, I highly recommend that you not advertise, use that address as your business address. Wow. Um, I met people in coffee shops, I met people at the state <coughs> hall, I met people in the library downstairs, I met people at their office, I met people wherever was convenient for them. And in the beginning, I had a lot of people telling me that's really unprofessional and you're gonna not get clients and people aren't gonna get that. And it was exactly the opposite. They were so chill about, oh, so I can just you know meet you in a coffee shop and we can have like a, a private area and I can talk about my case. That's so not lawyerly, that's so not a type, that's, I don't want to work with you. And so it actually ended up being a hook. Um, when Alan and I joined up together, that was no longer feasible, uh, so we looked for space, and we were really lucky in our neighborhood, we came across an old ballroom. So in within walking distance of where we live, we have um, a huge ballroom, very ornate, wood floors, absolutely spectacular. It's in a basement, so when you look at it from the outside, it looks like a storage yeah, it looks like absolutely nothing. And um, and it's kind of a showstopper when you walk into it. And I say that because I have nothing to do with it. I just rent it. Um, so that's what works for us now. Um, we do litigation. We take depositions. Um, we meet with clients. We meet with the person counsel. So I do meet all those things that Susan was talking about. And it's more client contact than perhaps just doing transactional work, although I, again, I've never done that. And then Ruth, you've also sort of rented space and with other attorneys and that. Yep. Um, I started out renting a P.O. box and working from my house, and it was a very, very good way to go insane because you are home alone all day talking to some people on the phone, and I, I didn't like that very much. So I wound up sharing space with a couple other lawyers that was like kind of like a co-working space that you see all over Soma now. 
um, which was great. We had a separate room for meetings that you could shut the door to, and it was very private, and there were other lawyers around, and it was nice, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't very professional looking. Um, and then I wound up moving to two other spaces subsequently, and now I'm sharing space with two other law firms, which is great, because we all practice in very different areas of law. It's nice to have other lawyers around. We shared space with a men's soap company for a while, which was great, but they were, you know, pretty quiet and didn't really understand that we were doing, you know, pretty high drama juvenile dependency work, and they didn't really understand our, you know, why we were so animated all the time when they were like, you need to put in an order for three bottles of shampoo now. <laughs> so now we share space with other lawyers, and they kind of, you know, they understand our limitations and, you know, being able to tell them about what we're doing, and we understand theirs, and we're all very respectful of each other's space and areas where we store files and stuff like that. So, and it's nice to have other colleagues around just to bounce ideas off of and ask questions about other fields of law that we're not familiar with. So I would definitely go with sharing space with other lawyers. Mine, when I first started off, I was doing, um, just taking on a few cases before I actually opened my office, and I was doing contract work for another attorney, and he was generous and told me I could use his conference room. But then it started to get to the point where I felt like my clients were confused about who, because he was a lawyer too, and they were using his receptionist, so I felt like it was time to finally go out and find my own. And um, mine is just in a, a big old warehouse building with tons of other startups and tons of other businesses. And what attracted me to my particular building is one of my former professors from Golden Gate is actually two doors over from me. So it was literally from the distance from here to the door where I can walk to his office. And he's established in my practice area and had been around practicing for 16 years and had a full library. So I could wander in, borrow his Kurzman's, which is now living on my bookshelf. But I could go and, you know, bounce ideas off of him and talk to him, at least initially. And I still say hi to him every morning. And, you know, I'm in his office at least a couple times a day, you know, someone to go have lunch with, and he has staff. So that was really nice. Um, and I got that space because he had called me and told me about it. So um, that's where I am now. Let me, let me just say, don't worry about fitting into anyone else's perception about what an office should be, what your you know setup, where it should be, what it should be like. If you're running your own business, you get to decide what works for you. So look at this as an opportunity to construct the world that you want to live in. How far do I want to commute? What type of environment do I want to be in? What access of different uh, transportation, businesses around me do I want? You have a chance to kind of construct the environment that you want to set up. So do it. Take advantage of that. Are there considerations for folks who are working out of their house or uh, working with the person that they share their house with? Uh, in terms of that separation in the, you know, is it now, if your office is in your bedroom, you know, you can never escape your work. And so do you have any tips, especially for folks starting out who may not be able to have that separate space? but to ma maintain some of that distance or have some separation. Shut the door and walk away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shut the door and walk away. Uh, yeah, I mean, the one nice thing is I feel like I don't take my files home with me, so um, I try to separate my work and life balance. Um, but yeah, I mean, I also say like, even in this day of cell phones, I feel like you're often, if, as a solo, like your phone may get forwarded, so you just need to learn the boundaries that even if you're, you know, even if you have your own office, your cell phone might follow you everywhere. So you need to learn when not to answer it. I mean, right as this panel was started, starting this morning, a client was calling, and I was like, I would, <coughs> I'm going to like voicemail, you know. You just need to learn those boundaries because <coughs> even if wherever you are, I feel like your practice may want to follow you, but it doesn't need to. Well, uh, Al, I think in the earlier session had talked about even if you don't have a big fancy brick and mortar establishment, if you have kind of a nice virtual presence, that may be enough initially to establish some credibility and, and communicate to the universe about the kinds of services that you offer. So I want to talk about your websites and uh, maybe to distinguish what do you need initially in terms of a, what would be a good enough website for somebody to get started, and then as you get more resources, you might want to spiff it up a bit. Um, but, but, you know, do you need to hire a web designer, and how complicated do you need to be, and how much time does it take to maintain that, that web presence? Um, and, and who even are you attracting? Are you attracting 
clients? Are you just communicating to other colleagues? I mean, what, what have you found? I know um, you have a, a nice website right now, so it looks like it, it took a lot of time to get that going. It did take a lot of time. Um, there are so many resources now to do websites for free, and they look super professional and nice. And you can you know, buy a domain name, it's like 10 bucks a year or something like that. And it can be up and professional in no time. We opted not to do that. We opted to do a really detailed website that's easy for us to maintain, but we hired someone to build it for us. Um, it's in WordPress, which is really, really easy to update. It's, I mean, I don't really, I like technology, but I don't really understand how computers work and stuff. So it's good to be able to log in and update things from time to time. It's really important to keep your website updated and dynamic and you know, maintain a conversation with whoever it is your target audience is. And we have a couple of different target audiences. Um, but ultimately, you can do it all on your own. There's, you know, we did it because we hired a designer because we are in a very niche field. Everybody has super fancy websites. We felt like we had to compete. If we were going to go back and do it over again, I'm not sure that we would you know, spend the money at the very beginning on a fancy website. I think you also have to think about where your clients are coming from. A lot of my clients, when I ask them if they have email, they tell me they don't own a computer. So the majority of my clients don't find me on the internet, which is probably reflective of how much, like I don't really spend, I did have someone design it for me. Um, it was a relative, so it was like a family support thing that I got it for free. So a lot of you might actually have a family member that knows code or knows how to do it and might be willing to help you out, do something. So that's what I did, and he was very particular about what type of website I was allowed to have. Like, I wanted to put that I did Zumba on my website, and he told me to take it off. He kept it very professional for me. So I would say that, you know, like for me, I wanted something simpler and professional. There was a lot of immigration websites with like flags waving and all these things going on <laughs> yeah. on the website, and it's just mine's very simple. And Whenever I, I do track where my clients come from, when on my intake I always ask them how do they hear from me, and when they say they found me on the internet, I'm always floored. I'm like, really? That's so great. <laughs> so, I mean, it just really depends on where your client base is. Like, I just know that the majority of my clients, I, I ask them if we can communicate via email, and they tell me they don't really use the computer, so. I think that having a website is imperative because I think that for most people when they want to find out about someone it's the first place they go and if you don't have a presence there I think you, you're going to lose out on a lot of people. But, you know the type of website uh, and what type of detail all the information that's on there that's going to vary by case but the fact is I think you should probably have one. Uh, I just got a visit from a sales person who was willing to help me post and redesign my website for the low, low price of $2,000 a month <laughs> for the rest of my natural born life. Um, so you can do that. Uh, it'll be completely out of your control and it'll look like everybody else that that person sold that website design um, system to. Um, you can do it yourself. You can do something in between. That's another place where you need to express your personal um, true to yourself when you're doing it and don't just hire the package or buy the package. Um, you'll attract the kind of clients that are going to buy with you and are going to work well with you and you're going to want to work for. So that's another place. There's not too many places along where you get to express your personality and be creative. You hold on to the ones that we have. Um, and I think designing the website is, is a real important one. And I think one of um, one of the things that's essential before you have a reputation is to cultivate one and to let the world know about your expertise. And so your website could be the vehicle or part of a campaign to do that. So a lot of attorneys will have a blog on their website where they're, you know, talking about updates in their area. And so that's a very easy, well, if you have endless time, um, that's a way to put put it out there in terms of your take on particular issues or to provide some an overview of an area that isn't providing legal advice. Um, but also you might look at other ways of extending that because if they're not coming to you, you need to find ways to push that content out. Uh, and so I will often recommend to the folks, whether they're job searching or setting up their own practice, to consider uh, other people's blogs and can they submit things as guest bloggers or uh, even on their LinkedIn profile to create 
that image of themselves that they want their clients and colleagues to, to view them as. And I'm curious if, if you've uh, been active in, in terms of using social media that way to create that presence before the, uh, the world has seen you in action, as it were. Um, we tried to put up a few blog posts and created a Facebook page and a Twitter account and all of that stuff before we launched, but the reality was we're, you know, you Facebook and blog and tweet about things that are happening now and building, you, it's just something that builds as you go along. So we reached out to a lot of people and actually had guest posts submitted on our blog and, you know, tweeted about those and kind of tried to get the word out that way. I don't know what effect it had, but everybody says you're supposed to do it, so we do it. Yeah, my, my thoughts are sort of similar. Like, I set up a, a blog and I have a Facebook page, but, um, and it's, it's a good project for one of my interns to constantly update articles and do that, but for the most part, like, I guess maybe I don't use it as effectively as I can, but I just, I don't find that that's where, I, I find that my wearing so many hats as a solo, that that's like, the hat that I sort of spend the least amount of energy on. And so I'm sure that, you know, I've heard a lot of people say that it's been successful for them, but I, you know, I tried to set myself up on Yelp, for instance. And my neighbor is number one in Yelp and immigration. And I find if you're not a regular Yelper, your, Yelps will, your Yelp reviews will get hidden. So if my clients Yelp me, but they haven't been regular Yelpers, that they're like barred from actually being posted to Yelp. Um, Yelp sort of will keep it private. And so it's been really hard to sort of, you know, I've been told that I need to use these social media tools and yet I've had a hard time sort of breaking into them and making them really work for me. And I, I don't know whether it's just I need to spend more time than what I'm doing to really make it work and pay back for me. But right now it just feels like it's taking more energy and it's really frustrating <laughs> to try to sort of break into these different areas when I haven't felt the return. And so I think that either you need to maybe talk to someone that's more savvy in it and get really great advice or sort of determine how important it is to your practice. But for me personally, I haven't felt like, I don't know, I get really frustrated with doing that type of thing. So. Well, it sounds like, it, as in, with every business plan, you need to figure out who are your clients and how are they finding you, um, or what is the purpose to doing? You know, yes, there's, there are long checklists we have for you. You may not need to do everything if it doesn't pertain to your practice. And so if your clients are uh, commercial clients, maybe, and they are finding you that way, maybe you need to attract them in a particular case. If your clients don't have computers, they're not reading your blog, you know? And so you need to know for yourself how best to allocate those resources depending on the goals. It may not be to uh, attract clients. Maybe it's to just establish yourself in your professional community to then get the referrals. And maybe your target audience are your peers. And then you figure out where are they and how do you find them and what resources can you put out there to uh, showcase your expertise within your peer community. Uh, so you might look at other practices in the areas you're most interested in to figure out what is the best use of your time since, as we have talked about, you're wearing so many different hats. Um, I'm going to take a step back and talk about something that may seem just a little bit more old-fashioned in terms of communicating to the world that you, you are here, and that is the good old-fashioned professional announcement. Um, and I still have this image. I still remember Heather walking into my office. I mean, I can still imagine you in our old space. Can, right after she passed the bar exam and came in with business cards or an announcement, I opened up my practice. And she came in and she met with us at LCS and the folks at the clinic, and there she was. Um, and I still remember it. And I'm wondering, do people still do that? Do they still print out cards on pieces of paper and put them in the mail? And if so, what are you saying? To whom are you sending that? Or is this all done virtually now? And uh, any of these for <coughs> good old-fashioned announcements? Yeah. I sent out a, an email to everybody that I had in my Gmail contact list. It was like, you know, people that I had emailed about jobs on Craigslist <coughs> years and years ago and just sent it hope not to annoy people too much, and then followed up a year later with a Christmas card that I sent to anybody whose physical address I had. I did something really similar. I sent out e announcements to pretty much all my professional contacts and anyone that I had interned for, anyone that, like my law professors, anyone that I thought would find it interesting, so like people they went to law school with. And then a year after I opened, I had an office warming party sort of saying like we've been here a year 
because when you initially open, you're not probably going to have the revenue to be wanting to buy a bunch of wine and cheese to have people into your space. So I, but I, I felt like it kind of went on, you know, it felt a little anticlimactic opening. And so then at a year mark, I had a big party and, you know, there were like 40 people in my space. So that was really exciting. Um, so that's what I did. When Borlea's lost, it became Bay of Borlea's, we didn't do any of that. Um, we did after a year. We did? Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's clear. Um, but after being open for a year, we did have a party, and that was actually a good way to kind of remind people that you're around. Christmas cards are a great way of doing that. Periodically doing some event where you can just get your name out in front of people and remind them that you're out there. However you do that, whenever you do that, is always a good thing. What I would do differently about how I did it, um, we do plan a side in 2012 edition. <coughs> I would court the defense bar a lot more, and I would court people who don't do my field of law. I was friends with all kinds of plaintiff's lawyers, but their referrals to me were the cases that they rejected. So do that calculation real quickly, figure out what you're getting. Um, and getting those cases in the beginning of your practice is great. Getting those cases in the middle of your practice or when you you should be closer to the top of the list for referrals, and not so great. So figure out where you're going to get your primary referrals. It's usually from people that aren't doing what you're doing. Yeah, and I was, you know, again, like everything else, you want to, and as Alan talked about in terms of the your, your workspace, you want to find the the way to communicate that most suits your style. Uh, and so if it's, you know, nice stationery and cards, great. Um, I just got an email, actually several of us got an email from a uh, recent grad. He's been out about a year. He just celebrated the one-year mark of his practice. and. It was great. Two paragraphs. Here's what I'm doing. I have these accomplishments with my practice. I know of these many cases. I'm moving into bigger space. Maybe some of you in the room have gotten this message. Um, but it was nice, and it was a way to say, okay, great. He's out there. He's successful. And there was a lot of conversation. Hey, did you get that email from that graduate? And so the faculty were chatting about it. And so, you know, it's just a way to remind your community and the people who already know that you're smart and are a good lawyer. Uh, that things are going well and they should you know send folks your way and, and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money it doesn't have to take a lot of time but you want to continue to loop these folks in um, any final um, thoughts we talked a little bit earlier about costs and just other bottom line things when you're starting kind of the have to haves that you know so the here we are on Saturday if by Tuesday these folks want to say I am a solo practitioner um, what are the have-to-haves that you just need to have when you're getting off the ground? A computer. A computer? Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. I got a Google Voice number, which I still use. Um, they're free. I don't know if they're harder to get now. I think Google has sort of limited on how many they give out. But um, it was a because I was really uncertain about, well, how do I want to handle my business calls? And I didn't want to buy a separate phone system. So I got a Google Voice number which rings to my cell phone and I can make outgoing phone calls from my cell phone from that number. Um, and it's free so I don't have to pay anything for that. So I would say the scanner that you can you know, scan, you can print, you can copy on it, but you can even get just a really basic flatbed one, but that after a few months was a little, <laughs> I actually like got a, not a very expensive one, but a $150 one at Best Buy or something that did it all and had a feeder big improvement in my life. Um, but a computer, a phone, and a printer. I'd say a bookkeeper too. <laughs> it's one of those expenses that you think you can get away with you know, skimping on at first, but they're so awesome. You don't have to sit there entering all your receipts and figuring out what money's going where. They're worth their weight in gold times 100. Are you saying hiring someone to be your bookkeeper? Yeah. And that this person would presumably have other lawyers who they work for as well? Yeah. OK, so it wouldn't be that expensive? No. How much? Uh, I think they're like in the range of 50 bucks an hour or like we pay us 200 bucks a month and it's the best thing in the world. And they send you profits and losses and you sort of see where you are as a business, which I ordinarily wouldn't do by myself. <laughs> you know, coverage. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we'll talk about that in another session. Yeah. 
Well, so I see there are questions in the room. So what <coughs> other questions are there for the panelists? All the way, please jump on it. Yeah. Oh, well, this is a comment. I work for, when I'm waiting for bar results, I work for two attorneys at the same address. One attorney paid 50 bucks for a business license, and the other attorney never did. And the city actually sent somebody out to the address to check who had business licenses and who didn't. And the second attorney got a citation for 150 bucks. So save yourself some money, go down here. <laughs> Actually, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. If you do practice out of your house, do not have your kids or your mom running around. <laughs> <laughs> because I can follow a client to this lawyer, and he sleeps with his mom, and the client complains. I go to his office, and his mom was there. <laughs> it's like walking in and out, listening to their conversation. So. Well, that's right. So you need to have a suitable environment. Now, if you are working out of your house and you don't meet clients there, but you need to make sure that others aren't answering your business calls or that they're not, you know, your kids aren't chasing each other while you're on the phone. And so you need to be able to set up those dynamics to at least create the illusion that you have a professional space. So one of my big concerns is insurance. I would assume everybody here has it. And it looks like it's up for discussion yeah. in the next, so maybe we'll look at Yeah, why don't we there. hold, yeah. But I would think that's part of your, one of your first startup costs. Um, can, you, can you really start up a business if you don't? Well, let's, you, let, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Okay. So the addition, yeah, but let's say, because I know the next okay. panel, we'll, we'll talk about that in depth. If you're working as a contractor for another firm, but are technically still self-employed, do you, do you all recommend still having a business license from the city and county of San Francisco? If you want to run your own business and the goal is to go open up your own practice and the contracting is just a means of getting the capital to go do that, yes. Set up the business sooner rather than later. Get it all started and rolling because the sooner you do that, the easier it's going to be to make that transition. What if it's not? I mean, I, I don't foresee ever having my own name on a shingle, but... I might. I mean, I don't know. I don't know whether there is a penalty involved, like the woman in the corner was saying about, because I am technically self-employed, but I don't have a law office of, you know, Jane Smith. The, but I remember reading it says like once you started occupying the actual physical location that is your business, so like you had to open it. So if you're going to have an address that is your business address, you had to open it within. You had to get your business license within 15 days of moving into that address. So if you don't actually have, a, I mean, you're supposed to post it in your place of business. So mm -hmm. I, when I was doing contract initially, when I wasn't sure whether I was going to do it, I didn't, I didn't get my business license until I actually decided At to a become separate space. Until I decided to have my law office, like I knew I was going to do the shingle. That's what I did. You mentioned the benefit of having a good scanner. To what extent are you paperless? Not as much as I'd like to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, how, I mean, that seems ideal to me, but is it feasible? More and more so, but yeah. not feasible at this point. Yeah. I think it just depends on your practice area, too. Like, my like when I go to court, there's no paperless option in my court yet. Okay. And so I need to be giving, phys like, I'm receiving paper from them. I'm giving them paper. I want to have a paper file. They don't have an internet option for the attorneys. Mm -hmm. They have it for the government attorneys, but for private attorneys, there's no internet option in court. So being paperless would mean like logging my laptop. It would just be a little bit more stressful at this point. And that kind of goes to, we were talking about startup costs on the computer. Having programs that convert between Word and PDF and, you know, I mean, those things are just invaluable and they're worth the money. I just want to go back to IOLTA accounts really fast. So I've been in practice for a month now. Um, I just passed the bar. And, um, Which had a very nice electronic <laughs> announcement. <too. laughs> I sent out an announcement, yes. yes. Um, and so, so far everything I've done is flat fee. And so I haven't opened an IOLTA account. My retainer agreement is written that fees earned upon you know, beginning work. So how important, if that's the majority of my practice, can I hold off opening an IOLTA account? Am I going to get trouble for this? Probably. I mean, I'm not probably getting in trouble. I, you can probably hold off. I held off. I mean, <laughs> I just opened it because I received like money back from the government for my client. They paid a bond 
and it was like a substantial sum of money and it was easier to have it deposited like have it in my name but then I paid my client out mm -hmm. but I I mean my contract is exactly the same and so until having that issue I didn't I felt like the ALT account wasn't an issue and you can open it really quickly so it wasn't a problem I mean it was up and running within a few days I think the only thing I would tell you is to call your bank and tell them when you finally write your first check especially if it's substantial because they they refused it even though there was the funds in the bank account because they were freaked out that it was such a large check. Okay. And you could always contact the state bar and you know these are areas where we don't want to mess around so right. if you want to make sure you know you might check with the authority to make sure. Yeah. Oh, well just a comment on that like I do uh, bankruptcy law and one thing about bankruptcy law is that you know it's usually flat fees and the fees are earned as soon as you file so you don't so it, it I think it depends on what area of law that you're in like as opposed to like the litigation where you are sometimes collecting fees that aren't quite earned yet <laughs> but they're in your hands then you would need a trust account but um, I know there are some areas of law where you it's not really uh, necessary you, you can kind of hold off for a little while uh, with opening a uh, trust account so it's not that imperative given you know sort of the business model in that area of law. Well, unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions at this point. We will uh, hopefully have some time later at the end of the day for more questions of the panelists. But I want to thank all of them for uh, being so candid and sharing their experiences with us. And we're just taking a short break to switch the line. Before we get to, to the question, somebody had the idea of uh, so we can have a little perspective of pulling the room and finding out where everybody is in terms of. Um, uh, the folks who haven't started a practice yet, who have started a practice, and who are only doing <coughs> contract work. There may be some little hybrids in there, but how about uh, a show of hands, everybody that hasn't started their practice yet? Okay, all right, thank you. And all the folks who have started their practice in some form? Okay. And folks who really are focusing on contract work only? Okay, it looks like one third, one third, one third. Maybe a little lighter on the contract work only. Um, all right, thank you. So the next uh, discussion here has to do with billing rates, retainer agreements, malpractice insurance, taxes, and legal research. So let me start off with uh, the billing rate topic. Uh, how do you determine what kind of rates to charge? And if you charge less than the big or medium-sized firms, does that affect your credibility? Uh, and how did you arrive at basically what to charge? So how about we start with uh, the new folks. Uh, Jason, would you like to take that one up? Thank you, Al. Yeah. When we first started our practice, uh, I had already been in, uh, let me take a step back. We practice in Napa County, which is pretty different from San Francisco or a larger city. But I did have conversations with other practitioners, other firms, solos, what have you, as well as other professional CPAs. I wanted to know, what were people paying for professional services? I worked for Merrill Lynch for about six months in Napa before I started practicing law. And I positioned myself, or I guess I positioned our practice, and we agreed to charge just below uh, what the, the small to medium-sized firms were charging and well below what the large firms were charging. I, I just want to add to that. Um, you know, in terms of competing with other firms, big firms, expensive firms, sometimes you don't want to be the most expensive person in the room. Um, in terms of credibility, you really want to focus on your clients and what kind of clients you're going after. Um, you know, being a $1,000 an hour trial attorney doesn't really help if your client really just wants to settle. Um, so keep that in mind. What kind of client base are you looking for? And also, one other thing, we do have a solely home-based practice. We meet a lot of clients in our home, um, which isn't going to work for people in who don't practice in a safe community like Napa is with a very low crime rate. Um, we don't meet with a, the other side in our home, but that saves us a lot of money. And we communicate to our clients the reason we charge the rates that we do and that we haven't raised them in four years is because we're cognizant of their financial position and that they are saving some money because we don't maintain an office with all the associated costs. So um, I have a little unique story to tell you because I didn't 
right off the back start my practice. What happened is I started my practice about a year and a half out of, uh, after I graduated. By that point, I had, a, uh, I had experienced a very niche area of the law, which was art law. So I, you know, so I ended up uh, leaving the firm I was working for a year and a half into, you know, uh, from graduation. And then I started my practice about 2002. Um, and I started working with the artists. And there's, I'm, I'm going to come back to the bidding because this all kind of changed the way I did my business plan. Uh, but about eight months into me doing my business, I actually was approached and I ended up going in-house working for a large multinational company and I became the general counsel for the following eight years. However, because I love working with artists and I was not willing to sell my soul all the way, I ended up <laughs> keeping my, law, uh, my art law practice on the side throughout this time. So I, I've been practicing, so I've had this crazy life of a general counsel all along the road and I still continue working with artists. And so, you know, when I started to think about my billing, it, it really, first of all, you have to think about who your clientele are. If you are representing immigrants, you know, who are, you know, here, who don't have the financial means, you cannot charge them hourly and large, you know, hourly sums. But if you are dealing with uh, companies, obviously, they have an uh, allocated amount of money for their businesses. So uh, every, every year they need to write off some of their expenses. So, you know, those clients are going to be very different. That said, what I learned right away is the best way for my practice was flat fees because there were certain things that you know I learned to do very well. So those things I do a flat fee because I know that there's not going to be that much of a surprise. But what I actually suggest to all of you is if you're going to do flat fees, please make sure in writing you tell your client exactly what you're going to be doing for that flat fee because that's where it becomes a tricky part. So if from your company and you're telling them I'm going to charge you a $1,500 for formation of the company, make sure you tell them that doesn't include their employment contracts, that doesn't include their independent contract contract, that doesn't include, you know, all those things that does not include, just make sure you include the things that are going to be part of your chart, because otherwise the client's going to come back and expect you to do other things. So be, write it, put it in writing. The other thing I learned is when I first started, I couldn't charge, you know, three, four hundred dollars an hour. But as you gain experience, so I started with 185 when I first started my practice, which was the ballpark of what you know people with my experts were doing. And then as you know, as you grow, you make sure you raise your fees also because you have a substantial. That what would have taken you two hours to do might take you 10 minutes, but you know you still have that. But what the clients are paying for is your experience and your knowledge. So as you grow older and wiser, you know you need to consider that too. So don't keep you know having the same fee for long term. So in fact, in my retainers, I always say that after a certain amount of time, we evaluate our, our fees and we will increase it if needed. And so the clients agree to it. And if I have to every year, I kind of look at it. And so today, I charge about $300 an hour, okay? I, I, I can charge more because of my experience, but I don't because I have to compete with the mid-side larger firms. And you know, I have to be cheaper than them. So, anyway. My view on fees is a little bit more, um, Organic. organic. Uh, I have. I, I definitely agree. You have to look at who your clientele is. If you have a, you know, I do family law, so I have sort of the range of people from very basic working class people to people who are making millions of dollars uh, a year. My fees tend to reflect how much I think the client can afford. Uh, I'm not going to charge uh, somebody who's making $50,000 a year $400 an hour. I would much rather, um, and you can charge $400 an hour, and they can say, sure, I'll pay you $400 an hour, and then you have a big uh, collectible at the end at some point in your practice. I would much rather say, you know, uh, I have a sliding scale, basically, and I size up my client, or my potential client, and I say, you know, um, uh, okay, I think, how, how does, you know, some number work with you? And if they say that number works, I'd much rather collect what I have agreed to charge them than to just uh, work for free at some point in, you know, find myself working for free and not being able to, to collect my bill. But as Masa said, when I started out, I charged a lot less. 
Um, I've been in practice for 30 years. I charge with people who have been around. You know, I have a good AD rating, et cetera, et cetera. So somebody who has uh, maybe one of your clients, who, or not one of your clients, but you know, somebody who works for a uh, big company, I'm going to charge a lot, a lot more <coughs> for. Um, so I think it's okay for you to assess your client's ability to pay, your desire for the work, and your willingness to work for an amount of money that you think is okay. I do, I charge for initial consultations. Um, that's because I learned over time that there were a lot of people who wanted to come in and meet with me and, and pick my brain for as long as they could, but they didn't want to pay, pay for the time. And I, my experience over time was that the people who want a free consultation, they, that's what they want. And they're un, they are unlikely to ultimately retain your services. So on my on any initial phone call with me, you know, I say great. Let's set up initial consultation, and uh, you know I expect that it's going to take an hour, and this is what I'm going to charge you for my initial consultation. And in my business, they always say, well, how much is it going to cost? And it's always like, well, I don't know. We're going to have to sit down and find out what your issues are because you know, depending on, and, oh, I have a simple divorce. Well, you know, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big range of, of, uh, of work is what is a simple divorce. It's simple to my mind. So, um, you know, I think you should be open to uh, your client's financial resources and then I think you, if, if you want to work for that client, you should set your rate to that client um, in, which is comfortable for both of you. And if I could just add something about flat fee billing, um, Masa was talking about flat fee billing and it's one of those areas we should probably talk about because it's just fraught with landmines. Um, one of the biggest problems is coming up with a number. Um, and I do have a cautionary tale for you. This is one of those do as I say, don't do as I do kind of things. Um, when we first started our practice, we were kind of you know, taking everything that came in the door. And we had some people who came in and they wanted to do a development agreement. They were developing a piece of property. And we had never done one before. I'd, I'd seen them and I figured, well, you know, I'm probably going to spend maybe five or six hours on it, maybe a few hours doing some research. So we bid it at $1,500. Our hourly rate is $250. So we found out, yeah, I know. We found out later um, other firms in town had bid the same project for $50,000. <laughs> so obviously we won. We got the bid. <laughs> we, learned, we learned how to do development agreements. It was a great thing. And in the end, we actually, the clients really appreciated that we worked so hard. And we've actually had a steady stream of work from them. So we've made up the 50000 and then some. So sometimes it's okay to kind of go under a little bit on your flat fee if you're trying to build a relationship. Sometimes that's more important. We have a firm policy of not paying for marketing and it really upsets marketing salespeople and advertisers. <laughs> but um, we use our billing structure and our billing policies as a way to do marketing. We will underbid projects on occasion to develop the right business relationships. Uh, even doing some work for free, but typically just undercharging what we normally would to develop a relationship. And Napa, being a small town, is all about relationships, as I think is every community. Um, as you grow, you will be, you'll get better at figuring out what are the relationships you really want to develop and where to spend your time. Um, but fees is a good way to market without saying you're advertising. Go ahead, Melissa. Can I, can I add, um, you know, I know Every, you know, it really depending on the type of practice you do, things do change in how you, you know, practice your, you know, or run your business. This is a business you're running. I, I cannot, you know, so of course we're all lawyers. We have the degrees and we have the ability to do this and go out there and make it happen. But I cannot emphasize enough to you how important it is to always remember this is another business, which means your client relationships are very important. And and you know. Throughout my 11 years of practicing, the only time I've had issues was with the billing. So you have to sometimes, you know, make a decision: is it worth 
to lose a client who's going to be a long-term client for you over a thousand dollar you know bill or is it you know worth to sort of bite the bullet and just you know take it as a loss just like any other business so the beauty of being a solo practitioner I have the ability to adjust how I'm going to deal with my clients based on the situation but there's certain things that are you know um, as they said you, you, you pitfalls you, uh, places you don't want to go for example as I said if you're going to do flat fees be very Honest with yourself that do things that are flat. For example, I do flat fees for trademark just applications because I know how long it's going to take. There's not going to be any surprise in that. I do that for doing an independent contract contract because I know how long it's going to take me. I do it for online, you know, um, policies, you know, uh, privacy policies because I know how long it's going to take me. But even with that, you have to give yourself, you know, a few hours here and there. So make sure. Don't do flat fees if it's an area of law you haven't done before. <laughs> and do not discount yourself too much because, you know, ironically, every client I've ever had any issue with has been clients that I either did work for free or I discount myself too much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do not do work for free unless it's a pro bono work. Do not do work for free. Even if it's a family member, if it's, if it's a $100 charge, they value your work because they're paying for it. If they're not paying for it, oh well, you know. They're not gonna. They're not gonna respect the work as much. So I, you know, I cannot emphasize. Please, you know, don't underbid yourself. No, I, I'm not talking about the situation where you're underbidding to get a client. I'm just saying, you know, as you build your clear relationship. Because in my practice, my clients have been with me 10, 11, 9, 8, 7 years. I have clients that have been with me for a long time. I started when they had an idea, and today we're running, you know, million dollar companies together. So, you know, my kind of client doesn't come in, and I, I think it's a little different in divorce situation, because hopefully they get divorced once. But so depending, it's, it's really, at the end of the day, what I'm trying to tell you is it really depends on the type of practice you're running. <laughs> Thanks, Masa. If there's any theme there I notice, it's, it's focus on the relationship and build that relationship and that trust with high quality work and then the fees are going to work themselves out. Uh, like Mary, thought you fell on your face there, but it turned out <laughs> fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great story. The next topic really relates a lot to billing as well. It's retainer agreements. How important is it to have a retainer agreement? Uh, what problems have we run into uh, when we didn't have a retainer agreement? What terms have we learned are essential to have in those agreements? Um, anybody like to start off with that? I, I think it's uh, state bar rules that you have to have a retainer agreement if you're going to be doing any uh, services for more than $1,000. So I think it's essential to have a retainer agreement. Uh, it, it defines your relationship with your client. It gives you a written contract upon which to sue if necessary in the future. and on which you might get sued, but it, it limits what you, it, it should specifically outline what services you intend to provide. Um, I think it's uh, very important to have a, a retainer agreement with your client. Somewhat naive, oh, I'm sorry, Rita, go ahead. Well, and just not to start any, I will not do any work for client other than an initial consultation until I have an assigned agreement. Somewhat naively, when we first started, I wanted to differentiate our firm from other firms. And <laughs> another so, cautionary tale. Yeah, another cautionary <laughs> tale. Um, I wanted to have a short, easy to understand fee agreement. And so I, it was really important for us that it be one page and no longer than one page. Well, that worked for about six months. And we got into a situation where we got really burned to the tune of about $5,000 by a client because one, we weren't collecting advanced fees and we didn't have the appropriate language in our fee agreement about that. We weren't charging interest on back bills. And so we, we had to utilize that well-tested loophole, if you want to call it, of waiting a year to run the statute and then proceeding with a mandatory fee arbitration. <laughs> And we won that because we did have a fee agreement which stated our hourly rate. And so if you choose not to have a fee agreement, which some attorneys, even established practitioners, do not use fee agreements, I don't understand why not. Um, it's not optional. And our, and just to add to that, our uh, agreement has gone from one page to three pages. Um, it's a little more detailed. It's still simple. It's still simple, but one of the things that's just as important as having the agreement is getting that retainer up front. In the beginning, we you know, were trying to be sensitive to the economy and we were you know, 
we were just sure that people were going to pay our bill when they got it, which <laughs> is just not the case. Um, so getting a retainer up front, it's good for you know making sure you get paid, but it's also really good for making sure that your clients value your time. Um, you know, if they haven't already paid a bill yet, they won't think twice about calling you at you know 10 o'clock at night on a Monday night um, to chat about things, not realizing that they're getting billed for every minute that they're talking to you. Um, so it's really helpful for that as well. Um, because it's hyper practice I do, I have three different kinds of retainers. They're very similar, but uh, it, it's really important to tailor it down to what you're doing. You know, when I do trademarks, uh, I have a completely different retainer than when I uh, get hired by somebody to do their business. Uh, because for business, I become their general you know, counsel for the company, so then, you know, I mean, general business uh, attorney. So that's a very ongoing relationship. So I have a very different, you know, because um, that's more general. Um, and then if it's a litigation or a, a dispute, then a complete different thing, because your business contract, you know, should not be the same as your litigation contract. Um, I cannot emphasize on how important it is to have something in mind. First of all, you know, at the end of the day, you know, some clients might not care, but the majority of people in this world are about image, believe it or not. Your clients are no different than anybody else. When you have something, you're an attorney and you have some nice, you know, uh, retainer agreement, don't make it too long. I mean, mine is about four pages, I think. <laughs> but, you know, don't make it ten pages. Uh, you know, you don't want to scare them off either. But when they, when they sit, it sets up a tone in a relationship that this is a serious relationship. So even if I do a work for six, I do a project for six hundred dollars, I still do a retainer agreement because that client might come back, and that retainer becomes a base of a relationship. And you know things like uh, change of my rate is in there. You know, I don't I don't bill monthly. I bill every other week. So I bill, and I tell you why I do that because my 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 work is I finish the work you owe me. So it's not like you know, uh, and the projects are project based. So usually a, a day or two my project is finished. So uh, my bookkeeper comes every week, uh, we do what the new bills, and then we follow with who is late after two weeks. It is, you know, I learned very quickly in my practice, people will forget if you don't send reminders. So a nice reminder, hi, I just want to tell you, your bill is outstanding. They respond. Immediately for <laughs> <laughs> They respond, and you know, if you wait, I've had a situation where I lost uh, both the client and was not paid in a couple of circumstances, a couple of situations, because I waited too long to bill them. You know, because, you know, it's just, you, you did the work, you need to get paid for it. So I do it, and my contract says every two weeks. I bill every other week, twice a month. It's a lot of work, too. Billing just takes a lot of time. If, if you're, you're doing, doing it yourself. No, I, that, that's, I, don't do, I don't do it myself, by the way. And um, one little thing I'm going to add to it. Uh, John's name was, if you can, if you have a bookkeeper assistant who does your billing, have them sign their name when they send the invoice out. It makes a huge difference. So my bills go from my... The, 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 my bookkeeper. So it's not my name saying, hi, uh, this is your invoice. And if they don't pay after one, then I will send them an email. And then usually that changes. But it, it's been really great because clients, you remove yourself from being the collection agency kind of that we talked about. So clients actually respond that better than when I actually um, used to send the bills myself. But I have a, I have a bookkeeper at home comes every week, so. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this applies to everyone's <laughs> practice, but we have all of the relevant parties sign our fee agreement. Um, sometimes we have a number of husband and wife or husband and wife businesses or we're representing them in an individual capacity in an estate planning matter. Get all of the parties who are responsible for your fee to sign the agreement. Because we've been in the situation where a wife, there was a divorce and wife said, oh well, my husband's responsible for that. No, you both signed the agreement, you're both responsible. And I, I'd like to suggest that uh, there you can probably get sample retainer agreements from your uh, malpractice carrier. May have a sample, and especially when we talk about malpractice, <coughs> that they want you to have, or they may provide you with information about things they don't want you to have in in your uh, uh, retainer agreement. Perhaps they don't want a uh, arbitration clause in your in your retainer agreement there's certain things I, I think uh, the state bar website may have a, a uh, yeah. sample retainer agreement the San Francisco Bar Association may have a sample retainer agreement for you to look at and certainly I agree with Masa your retainer agreement should be uh, specific to the type of, 
uh, work that you intend to do for that client. Oh. I was just going to say another thing to add, um, going along the same lines, it's really important to make sure you have the scope of the work that you're doing very clear in your letter. Um, that has come up, like Jason said, we've had to do a fee arbitration and that comes up. And let me just add one more point. The State Bar actually has a number of fee agreement terms and clauses so that you can pick and choose what applies to you and what doesn't. <laughs> also, there's a, it's called the Foonberg book, I think it's Jay Foonberg, mm -hmm. has a how to start your fee agreement, but I would not use it uh, word for word because we had to do a lot of editing from that. Okay, uh, the next topic is malpractice insurance, and it is a, a quick segue, I think if you don't have malpractice insurance, you have to disclose that in your retainer agreement, so that is an essential term. Uh, but malpractice insurance, uh, do, you, do you have it when you first started off? Did you have it? Has the price changed as you've gotten uh, more experienced? And uh, what do you watch out for? Um, and any tips on how to shop around for malpractice insurance? Sure. Um, I actually, I mentioned that I work for Merrill Lynch, uh, and one of the parts of the training program was you get your insurance license. And it was kind of eye-opening because I learned that insurance brokers make up to 50% of your first year premium for whatever insurance product they're selling. So if you're gonna use an insurance broker, which I do recommend you do, make sure that they are bending over backwards to get you the best policy for your practice. Um, we have a great guy who we use, who's out of town, but not too, he's in Marin County. Um, it is expensive. I think the first year was somewhere between four and 5,000 for both of us together. Now it's probably between six and 7,000, I think. It's one of the top uh, fees or expenses your business is going to have. It's the t because we don't have an office expense um, or rent. Uh, it is our number one expense. I would just add, yeah, it's really expensive. Um, we work from home, so that actually is our big, biggest expense, is our malpractice insurance. Um, it's very expensive, but it's not as expensive as screwing up and getting sued by your client. Not that that's ever happened, but it could. <laughs> I'm going to touch on a topic that was talked before, which is what type of entity you have. Uh, so I, I'm, I am a business lawyer, so let me, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the reality of why insurance is important for you if you are a solo practitioner and you have a sole uh, proprietorship, which I do. If you have any assets, you know, um, I, I recommend you separate your company from your um, from, uh, from your personal assets, so you set up some kind of an entity. The challenge is, first of all, uh, the lawyers as a professionals have limitations on what kind of entity they can have. So it's not like you can go up an S-Corp. So ten the tendency is our taxes are much higher if you have an entity versus you being a sole, uh, a sole proprietorship. So that's part of the reason why you find out a lot of the solo practitioners are sole proprietorships. Okay, so just have that in mind. But if you don't have insurance, what's going to happen is, um, you know, I, I, I think, that the first thing I did, there was two things, the insurance and my website. Those were two important parts of my, the beginning of my business. That's the first two things that I invested in. And the reason for the insurance is because it, the biggest dispute you're going to have is somebody's going to, somebody doesn't want to pay you. So what they're going to do is say, you didn't perform well. And they're going to come after you for that. And by the time you finish proving that you did a good job, You've spent a lot of money and time trying to do that. So you already you know, are at a loss, even if you win that case. So the, the, the thing about insurance, obviously, they take, they take it take them off and off on themselves to take care of the situation. So it's important to have the insurance. Like any other business, you should have your insurance. I mean, that you should. That, you know. If you choose it's too expensive, well, you know, uh, let's say that you don't have any, I, I, it's hope that you don't have any assets, because people can't come after your assets first. So you know, you kind of what I'm trying to tell you is, if you can, it's an expense you need to add and expect to have in your practice, and you write it off. I mean, it's a write-off for you, right? So when I first started my my practice, uh, a company called Lawyers Mutual is who I use, and they were actually recommended through the state bar, and their specific niche was people who just got out of law school and were starting their practice. So my premium was very very low, and. As uh, you grow, obviously because of your experience and the number of clients you have, your premium goes up because they're all already covering uh, a bigger uh, number of people uh, as you grow your practice. But uh, the good thing about them, they haven't been that expensive. I still pay only about, I think I pay like 3500 and I'm on my 11th year practice. 
Uh, but one of the things that they require is that you have to have a, a take MCLE classes with them. So they have uh, four, hours, but they start off with six hours. So you have to uh, take six hours a year for you to be able to renew. And then as you uh, uh, become more experienced, by the third year you just take like four, four hours, I think. Which actually helps because for me right now, I don't have to run out and uh, do my MCLEs because I have to pay it in February, right? So I, you know, actually I have covered all my MCLEs right now. So that kind of pays off also. Um, so my recommendation is I do agree with them. You should go with a broker. I mean, just go out there and try to get the best deal. Just like what you, what you advise your clients to go get the best deal, do that for yourself. <laughs> well, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I think uh, malpractice insurance is, is going to be your uh, uh, safeguard against uh, losing your assets in the future. I'm, I'm a sole proprietor. Um, when I started out many, many years ago, my uh, malpractice insurance cost uh, about $600 a year. Uh, it's 10 times that now. But um, you also need to know that your insurance, people's insurance is more expensive or less expensive depending on what kind of uh, practice you have and um, what the uh, you know, what the insurance company's experience is with people in your type of practice being sued. So, uh, certainly there are certain types of practices that are uh, less costly for them to insure and certain others that are more likely to um, end up with a lawyer getting uh, sued and the insurance company having to defend. Also, what you need to know is that um, on on malpractice insurance, uh, just like your homeowner's insurance, there's uh, deductibles and um, there's certain coverage limitations. So you need to read your policy. I agree with getting a broker um, and having your broker walk you through why whatever uh, potential insurance coverage they have provided you as an option is, why one might be better than another and, and, and what you can uh, what you can afford. But certainly, as it said here, uh, next to rent, uh, your malpractice insurance, or my malpractice insurance, is my, my biggest outgo uh, and taxes. I want to make uh, three brief points about malpractice insurance. Um, a lot of people, especially new practitioners, say, I'm saddled with debt. I have no assets. But a judgment against you earns 10% interest. And I doubt that your, your student loan payments are incurring interest at 10%. Um, we're with Travelers right now. We, we switched two or three times. Um, they cover pro bono work outside the deductible so that if we're doing pro bono work and we make a grievous error, um, we don't have to come up with our deductible, which is nice. They also cover our work as notaries. And because we are business and estate planning attorneys, that's really nice. Uh, it also covers our work as directors, if we serve as a director of a corporation or a nonprofit. Um, those are the three points I want to make. Uh, I, I, go ahead, Can I have here? one last thing? I just want to tell you, um, number one, um, uh, disputes uh, and lawsuits in, uh, for law firms and lawyers is uh, uh, bill dispute the clients. That's number one. And I just want to warn you that uh, your insurance policy will go up every single time that you dispute. That, that it puts you on a red flag. Mm -hmm. So sometimes coming back to billing, just bite the bullet and you know lose that bill as a lost your company because it's not worth even for your insurance purposes. It's just kind of point that out. Yeah. Yeah, your malpractice and car carrier will tell you where the common disputes in your area of law will occur, either litigation or bankruptcy. And when you fill out and you get your insurance, they want to know, if, do you have a system for calendaring statute of limitations? Do you have a system for uh, returning client calls? Do you have a system for checking statuses of cases? And make sure you do, in fact, have a system. You have to declare that you do have those systems, at least for a litigation practice, and make sure you actually do, and they'll serve you well. Um, so that's malpractice. Uh, taxes. When self-employed, what taxes do you pay that you would not if employed by a company or firm? Can some of these taxes be offset by business expenses? Uh, what type of planning do you need to do throughout the year uh, with taxes? So I'll, I'll start that off. And uh, if, you're, if you're in San Francisco, there's a furniture tax 
on the furniture and computers you have in your office, so just be aware of that. Uh, beyond that, uh, taxes, who would like to start off on this topic? Uh, well, I'll just say, I don't do our taxes, so I'll just, I'll be brief. Um, <laughs> we are, we're in a unique situation because Jason and I are married and we live together and we work from home. So every meal we have, everything we do is deducted. So, <laughs> <laughs> we take an aggressive tax approach for ourselves, not necessarily for our clients. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, Self-employment tax is the biggest tax you pay if you're not employed. Right. 15, I think it's about 15% if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. um, but that said, if you're employed, you don't get to write off stuff. If you are self-employed, you, you get to write off a lot of things, including the lease on your car. So for example, for me, uh, even though for a long time, you know, for about eight, nine years, I was in-house counsel. I chose to still be an independent uh, contractor because at the end of the day, uh, by writing off my expenses, I actually saved more on my taxes because I could write off things that I couldn't write off if I was in the free. So um, you can write off a lot of things. I mean, you don't want to cheat, but I mean, just, you know, you talk to your, I'm not saying, like, you know, uh, don't write off your dog's meal because that's not, you know, a, a write-off or, you know, but what I'm saying, uh, <laughs> don't want to write off things. But I, you know, unless he's employed, I, I guess it's employed. <laughs> unless he's reading your contracts for you. But um, uh, but if you talk to your accountant or your uh, bookkeepers, there's a lot of things I can tell you about what to write off. I uh, I when I wanted to depreciate my car, that's when I hired an accountant because otherwise I could have done I could do my own. I probably could still do it now, but I have an accountant. Uh, you need to be aware that it, it, if you're self-employed, uh, you need to pay your quarterly taxes due January 16th and February, I mean, April and quarterly. So you need to pay quarterly taxes. Uh, when I first started out in practice, that came as a huge shock to me. My father, who was an accountant, like was, what do you mean you didn't pay your taxes? <laughs> it's, um, so you need to pay your ta your quarterly taxes. So that's something you need to budget in, uh, and you need to keep track of what your income is and what your out what your deductible outgo is, so you can get an estimate about how much your quarterly taxes are. Um, I was recently annoyed to receive a notice from the California State Franchise Tax Board that they thought I should be paying use tax. I don't want those two. This is the state now that it is in deep financial uh, worries is looking at any way to uh, fill their coffers and if you uh, if you file a tax return showing over a certain number of dollars of income, I think it was $100,000, you got a notice from the state saying, oh, well, you haven't filed your use tax returns. And I called my accountant and I said, what is this? And use tax is basically a tax on any out-of-state purchases that you have made that uh, you didn't pay California state uh, sales tax on. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, your Amazon purchases. Uh, so, you know, I sent them my $15 for whatever it was that I could trace for the past four years of having purchased something out of state. But, um, you should be aware that there is a use tax uh, and that it may or they may not be enforcing it, but uh, they want you to pay it quarterly just like your uh, your state. Uh, and, and your, uh, of course, you pay state and federal um, taxes. I would uh, add to this, besides the fact that you can't get fired if you're self-employed by anybody or laid off, <laughs> the tax advantages is probably the single best thing. Um, there are just so many ways to shelter income. Uh, Mary and Jason, I hadn't heard that one. I mean, that's really good. Uh, <laughs> if it works, we haven't gotten audited yet. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been audited either. But I have. I recommend that your CPA be a tax lawyer. My CPA is a tax lawyer, and a lot of tax lawyers do tax returns. 
they get the attorney-client privilege. It's just fantastic. They know how to be aggressive. They know what the IRS is interested in and is not interested in. We're constantly getting irritating little letters like Janet talked about from all the different agencies for some little thing. And luckily so far they've been minor irritants, but they are very irritating. And I don't know how to deal with them, so I send them to our tax person. We pay probably not a lot of money. It's pretty good. We're a corporation. Um, I don't know which one, which little letter after it, but that has allowed us to create a 401k profit sharing plan, a defined benefit plan, and when we have really good years, we're able to shelter a lot of money pre-tax. So in addition to riding off vacations when you give a speech in Maui and, and creating profit sharing and defined benefit plans to allow you to shelter a lot of money, it's, it's really fantastic being self-employed. If you're just making a W-2 from a big firm, those taxes are brutal. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Uh, I'd like to add one thing about tax. Because Mary and I do show a low adjusted gross income, think about are you going to go out and try and get a business loan? Are you going to try, out, try and refinance your house? Because banks, especially in this economy, are reluctant to extend credit to people with high student loan debt and low income. Um, you know. The local community banks have been more flexible, but if you walk into Wells Fargo and you say, I make $20,000 a year, but I have a gross over $100,000, they don't care what your gross is. They're going off their rule of AGI or however they calculate how much money you take home. Um, that's a, a cautionary tale. Okay, uh, access to legal research and other legal resources. What suggestions do you have for doing legal research and investigations considering cost and accessibility? Anybody like to start off with that? Sure. Oh, go ahead. I, I would say this comes under the topic of keep your overhead as low as possible. And once you sign up for Westlaw and uh, whoever else is out there, you'll find you get a monthly recurring library uh, bill that may or may not be worth it to you. Um, certainly, I think uh, having online uh, access is very convenient, but there is a there is a cost. If there can be a cost to it, although I, I do understand that there's some. Uh, websites out there that you can get a lot of uh, research done for free. Uh, if you're first starting out, I would say uh, find space with people who might still have books. Uh, use Golden Gates Library. Use the there's like uh, the San Francisco S uh, City Library has a law library. Uh, I would try to keep your library costs and um, down. Because it is an ex once once you get a subscription, they just keep billing you, and they always are, are uh, updating their volumes, and you just keep getting bills for your uh, library. Uh, I think someone else on another panel already mentioned CEB. CEB is wonderful. CEB tells you what to do. It gives you forms. It gives you advice. It's totally free, and you get it for, for a year. year. For yeah. one year. Um, what we did, because there's two of us, um, I, we did his year, and then we did my year, piggybacked on, the, on after his year. Um, and we've also, you know, talked to other people about, you know, adding on years. Um, we had the pleasure of meeting Pam, I think her name was Jester or something yeah. like that. She's the person who runs CEB. We She's met her last year. Um, really nice person. Their whole thing is that they want to help solo practitioners, young practitioners, um, and they really make it easy and convenient and free. And we also have um, a law library in Napa. It's not as convenient, but it is free. They have all the practice guides, so look into those kind of resources. Um, we also buy NOLO books. Um, NOLO books are really useful. Um, you know, they're not really written for attorneys. They're written more for lay people, but I've found them, especially with things like probate. We do probates. A lot of stuff, a lot of steps, and they make it really easy for you, and they give you all the forms and whatnot. And I would just want to add, it upsets me when clients come in and they say, I read this on Google, or I read this on the internet. Google is not an ABA accredited law school. Uh, <laughs> and when I see attorneys do the same thing, it really frustrates me. So just as important as having sources is making sure you're using the right sources. 
on that, I do, I do, I do a little bit disagree on one level. Okay. Um, sometimes doing an online search can give you on Google mm -hmm. can give you guidance on what you need to look sure. for. Sure. Okay. Sure. So yeah. when you come in, like, I, you know, I, uh, I, my firm, I believe in uh, technology. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of technology, and um, yeah, I, I have uh, part of it because I do work with startups a lot. So I have to be on top of it. When I go to meet with them or talk to them, I need to know what the hell I'm talking about. I need to know what the hell they're talking about. Because you know, otherwise it goes off your head. Top of your head. But uh, I found search, like Google and stuff, is good because they would reference you some article, some blog, or some, you know, some, uh, uh, some information that if you read, then from that you can see, you can you know, limit your, your research and then go to the library and pull out the right resource to look at. So, you know, do use your resource, that's for free. And your, you know, the, the G2 library, hands down, one of the best libraries, okay? So, I am, I'm lucky, I'm an adjunct professor, so I don't pay for my fees. And I get the um, Westlaw for free. Twitter, <laughs> as an adjunct. But I, I don't, they don't pay me much, so I guess that's part of that. That's part of you. We, we leveled that. Anyhow, but um, but I, I want to tell you that the resources downstairs and the people downstairs are great. So every time I do new things, which I do on occasions because I like challenge myself, because uh, it gets boring after one doing the same thing. Uh, downstairs, they're amazing. So use your resources. And other thing is just like uh, your colleagues. You know, uh, uh, your friends uh, who are in the same business, or you know, your your, your uh, friends who graduated with you, they do different things. Just call them up; they know where to, to where to tell you to go look for certain things that you're not finding. So use your resources. I just want. Oh, sorry. I wanted to add that Google Scholar is now carrying a number of law journals, as well as I think every published federal case and most California cases, if not all of them. So if you're paying for that as part of your legal library subscription from Lexis or Westlaw, you're probably paying too much. Um, What's that called again? Google what? Google What's Scholar. Google Scholar. Oh, wow. you, it's kind of buried a couple steps down from mm -hmm. the home page of Google Scholar, but it's in there. You said they have uh, published federal cases? I believe so, yes. And then also California? Yeah, I believe so, yes. Wow. Also, the search terms are a little hard to use sometimes. Yeah. You kind of have to know what you're looking for. Very specific about your search. Also, you, connector and all that, so. you do federal stuff, almost all of it's online now via Pacer. Mm -hmm. those Pacer is federal. so cheap, it's like 10 cents a page or something. 8, cents. Cents. Eight cents a page. Okay, at the, at the break, um, we get to go till 12, 15, Jan, is that right? Um, well, we could break earlier. Right, we have, there was a couple questions that Suzanne yeah, so told me about. Okay. Uh, independent contractors and fee agreements uh, for the panel. Do we have contracts with our contract attorneys when we have them do work? And then um, how do we, if we split fees, how do we handle that with the contract attorneys? Anybody feel like uh, tackling that one? We don't do that. So we uh, we have gotten referral fees from other attorneys, and it was uh, basically a handshake over the phone thing. Um, we don't have a lot of experience with that. But I, if you do it, you should have an agreement. I'd be careful too, also, of making sure that you're covered under their malpractice insurance if you don't have your own. I don't know what that looks like, so we don't do that. But uh, referral fees between lawyers is a, is a bit tricky. Uh, I have received some. I've never paid any, but I know for referrals, for instance, on a personal injury, you probably know this better than I do. Uh, if if he, the if the referring attorney is going to be receiving any fees, it has to be disclosed to the client, mm -hmm. and the client has to agree to it. Um, so be careful about that. Uh, handshake may not, uh, I mean, certainly handshake between the lawyers, but the client has to be um, filled in and has to agree to that. So uh, You should see what the other attorney is disclosing to the client, yeah. which we did. And I have never uh, hired a, a contract attorney, but I think it would probably be a very uh, good idea to have some kind of a written agreement so everybody knows what their uh, obligations and duties are. Uh, but I think if you do hire a contract attorney, you may need to uh, contact your uh, 
uh, malpractice carrier because uh, work that they do for you is going to come under your malpractice insurance. That's really good advice. I think it's all because when you send it in, send a letter to them say, I just hired a contract lawyer and he's going to be working. They usually don't raise your rates, but now they know about it. And so if there's a claim, there's going to be coverage, likely. But Jan, did you raise your hand there? Well, I was just going to add because I used to do contract attorney work for corporations. And this was really good. Exactly what I would say. The first thing was I'd always check my track about practice insurance. I have coverage under it. The other thing was is that I got burned actually because I think for a large corporation, um, I didn't have a contract and I was working for somebody. And um, just like what all of you have been saying, they started nitpicking one of the bills. And I was like, what is going on? And um, it was really just they were having some financial issues and didn't want to pay me. And after that, I always had an agreement. Um, I was very careful about the scope of the agreement, what the fees were going to be, and all of that. Um, it was really important. I, you know, I was surprised, but it doesn't really matter. I think you have to have all those things no matter who your client is. So I would just, you know, sort of re reinforce everything that's been said, even with co large corporations and companies that you do the same thing with your independent contractor. I agree with Jan. And also to, to uh, add some more to what Janet said, we're a contingency fee practice, so if you're sharing fees with a contingency <coughs> fee lawyer, you have to make sure that that fee split is disclosed to the client and they sign off on it. That is imperative, otherwise you're going to be limited to quantum merit, uh, just a reasonable pay for your hourly time, which could end up being significantly different. So don't rely on the lawyer you're sharing fees with to get the client to disclose it, or to get the client's signature on the fee split. Make sure you get that signed, otherwise you won't have something that's enforceable if the case suddenly gets big and you're looking at a handsome fee. Um, but if you're not, if you're just working on an hourly basis with a lawyer on a case and your work, your payment does not depend on the outcome, technically you do not have to have a contract. However, I agree with Jan, the best practice is to spell it out and get it all in writing and then you're going to be in good shape uh, with that lawyer if there's a dispute. So I think... Um, that about does it for the uh, logistics to set up, and uh, should we move into lunch now, Jim? Yeah. All right, well, one more question, question in the back, yeah, go ahead. Kind of generally, disability insurance, retirement, kind of planning for bigger life issues? Sounds lovely. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not really there yet, but it sounds like a really good idea. Yeah. Anybody else? We, we just got uh, new insurance, and we're very excited that we have vision and dental. Um, so we're kind of more there, but. We spend a lot of money on our health care insurance. We just signed up with Kaiser and have a very nice plan through Kaiser. It's very expensive. Um, as far as retirement, you depending on your entity type or an LLP, you might be able to set up a retirement plan. But right now, we're just we're trying to do debt service on our student loans, to be perfectly honest. Go ahead. I just have a quick question. If you are doing contract work for an attorney who doesn't have insurance, then should you have your own insurance? I think you should. It's relatively cheap. That kind of okay. insurance is really, really cheap in my experience. I don't know what anybody else does. Another question back yeah. there? Yeah, I had a question about billing rates and contract work. How do you know what a good billing rate is if you're doing contract work for another attorney? I think you can survey the market, or Carolyn Reinhold behind you is an expert in that area with solo support. Um, but survey the market, call up people who are doing that same kind of work, talk to Carolyn about it. Um, I just have a comment about the, uh, the malpractice insurance question. For people who are just starting out their practices and are maybe thinking of taking cases from referral panels, I think it's Lawyers Mutual has a special policy for that. Well, it's only $500 a year because it's coming through a referral panel, it's been screened, there are mentors available, and so that's a great way of getting experience, getting insurance, because always malpractice insurance carriers are going to want to see that you always add insurance. Right? And um, it's also a great way of getting experience and having mentorship um, in the area that you're interested in practicing. Any other questions? Can I just make one comment? Kat just brought a very important point, by the way. Um, 
if you don't get the malpractice insurance, it's going to get harder to get it in the future. Mm -hmm. I, that's a very good point, by the way. I, I totally skipped me because I, so they look to see if there's no gap. If there's a gap, what they do is they say, we're not going to cover you from before that. Well, you have all of these claims that can have, have potential. So just to let you know, the earlier you get it, the better it is. And no gap, don't have gaps. <laughs> the same could be said for health coverage. If you're going to be paying for your own health insurance, you don't want a gap there either. Yeah. All right. Lunchtime, Jim? Okay. All right. Um, to get us started, um, we're going to talk about marketing. And it's great we've got different different practice areas up here, so I think there's some different marketing techniques. Um, what kind of marketing do you do? And is there a particular kind of marketing that worked well when you first started your practice? Um, and conversely, are there are there kinds of marketing that didn't work well, and why do you think that was? And Mary, I'd like to start with you. Okay, put me on the spot. Um, yes. So our policy is we don't pay for advertising, just flat out. Do not pay for advertising. Um, that works really well for us. Um, so what we do is we try to come up with creative ways to get our name out. Um, the most important thing is to try and figure out who is your client, who are you trying to market to, and how are they going to find you. Um, Clients these days, our clients at least, they don't look in the yellow pages for an attorney. Um, they're going to ask their friends, you know, they're going to say, I need an estate plan. Have you had one done? Who have you used? Who do you like? Um, so we really focus on referrals. Um, also, internet presence. Um, I think someone mentioned Yelp earlier in another panel. Um, that's a weird place to get referrals, but it really works. We get a lot of uh, stuff from Yelp. Um, so that's really important to make sure that you have a good presence on Yelp. Um, Christmas cards, I think someone mentioned holiday cards. It's a good way to remind people that you're still here and you're still doing stuff. Um, every year when we have an anniversary, we send out a press release to the paper, and they always run it because they are always wanting content, so that's a good reminder. Um, you know, Googling Google AdWords is pretty good. We've gotten some stuff from that. Um, one of the things that I do, which is not typical, but kind of a weird way to advertise, um, I write a column for the local newspaper. It's a bi-weekly column. It's just about business law. It's uh, basically for individuals and small businesses. Um, really basic stuff, you know, do I need an LLC, that kind of thing. Um, but people love it. They read it and they think, oh, she's an expert. I'm going to call her. Um, so that's been a great source of income, kind of a weird place to get uh, clients from, but it's worked out really well. Great. Um, Alan, did you want to chime in? Um, no. Being in litigation, particularly in funnel law litigation, I don't want to repeat client. My client's been fired from more than one job, bad client. So it poses an additional problem, which is it's not that I'm just trying to get a client and keep them, so they constantly need new and new clients. Um, in that sense, referral is still the best. It's great to have the web presence and advertising visibility is always good. Uh, but most of the clients come in from previous clients, it, witnesses, believe it or not, opposing counsel from other cases. And that's where visibility is really key, staying involved in the legal community. People know you, they will think about you, and they will refer business to you. And it works better than advertising. We've tried advertising, sometimes it works really well, sometimes it doesn't, it's really a crapshoot. One of the advantages you have with professional organizations is that they all have websites and they list all the attorneys who are members. And the further you're up you are on that list, uh, the better it is. So the more places where your name comes up, the better chance you have of referring business. But with you know the employment law, you know it, it, it's not a targeted audience. So it's just it's a more difficult proposition. Okay, thanks. Um, Malta? Are we, sorry, I, I, I oh, it's about working. marketing. The um, marketing in it. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, my business is a little more unique because I work with mm -hmm. artists and then entrepreneurs. So I have a complete different uh, sort of audience in some sense. So I, I had to figure out how I can appeal to both um, simultaneously. So for, for me, my website is an essential part of my business because I, I had to uh, come across uh, that. This is a creative firm. At the same time, it's a very serious business firm. And 
I know people always ask me about this art and business, how do they relate, but really at the end of the day, every artist is also an entrepreneur in some way or another. So if you can sort of communicate that with them. So my website, I, I tell you because uh, my clients tend to be very uh, savvy, internet savvy. So they do their research, they look up my website, they look at my LinkedIn um, you know, uh, account. I highly recommend that if you're going out there, it is very bad to put a LinkedIn account out there and have referrals through LinkedIn. You'd be surprised how much uh, people keep up with you. So because your bio is on there. Um, you know, Facebook, I'm, I'm not a fan of it because Facebook is more of a, you know, it means a fun place, it's not a professional place. That's why I use LinkedIn instead. Um, but referrals, the biggest referral I have is clients. So as I said, my clients tend to be long term. And my niche is photographers. So um, uh, you know, commercial photographers, wedding photographers, you know, more of a, some of them are pretty well known. And, and then I have some uh, filmmakers and so on. And then I have some startup companies. Um, the photographers, the way I got it was the very first photographer was when I was working in a law firm and she came in because the person she was working for uh, was suing her and saying that the pictures that she took was owned by him now that she had left. And it turned out they had no written contract. So, you know, we just responded to his demand letter and he disappeared. And she became one of my best clients. She's, you know, out of her I've had like maybe 40, 50 referrals. Uh, photographer referrals, some of them long term, some of them short term. Um, she, you know, one of the things she did is had me go to panels and talk in, uh, you know, the photographer had a, had a panel where they would talk and come and talk about business and referral for themselves. And she had me invited to talk on the, you know, uh, at their events. That was a huge sale for me. So that's how my business kind of took off the way it did. So what I, my, my recommendation is, you know, lawyers actually haven't been referring much business to me. I don't really get this from lawyers. I send business to lawyers, but I don't really get business from lawyers at, at the end of the day. I might get one or two here and there. Um, I think a business associations are probably a better way, and if you have a niche, try to get in and, <coughs> and sell yourself within those groups of people. Um, and one, mm -hmm. one final note, use yourself for the, for the person that you are in, in the world. I'm Iranian, I'm a woman, I'm a woman of color. You'll be amazed how that sells. You'll be amazed how that sells. In the LGBT community, I'm a queer Iranian woman. My God, best clients out <laughs> Because people like to feel that they relate to their lawyer. So they relate to me. If they relate to me, they bring their business to me. So don't underestimate who you are in this world. So use it. Excellent point, Um, And just to build on that, there are many, many ways to network that, you know, can be built into a marketing scheme. I joined a networking group pretty recently, and the whole purpose of the group is for people to refer business to each other. There are two lawyers in the group, and we're both in the room. Um, <laughs> but it's great, because you, know, you get to interface with other people that are not in the same profession, and I find that a lot of, mostly people maybe know one lawyer or two lawyers, and they will turn to those lawyers for advice in any range of, of issues they might encounter. So it's kind of nice to be in touch with a whole bunch of lay people that you know might need your services of some sort. I don't know if it works for a super specialized field like yours, but you know it works for us. We do adoption, assisted reproduction, and a lot of family law. And people, everybody has issues surrounding their family, especially in San Francisco. So networking with lay people, making it fun. I really, really just like going to networking events that I don't find entertaining. Um, I like. I kind of stand in a corner and I'm like not encouraged to talk to people and there's really no point in doing that. So finding stuff that's fun for you, getting your name out there, getting your face out there, and you know, letting everybody in the world know what you do. That's awesome. And um, so just to <clears throat> dovetail a little bit on that, is that especially in those areas of law where your you know where your clients are maybe not businesses, oftentimes you might be the only lawyer that they know. And so you'll get, well, I remember when I was practicing, I routinely, I did immigration law, but I routinely got people walking into my office asking, hey, can you draft a will for me? You know, or hey, I'm going to buy a house, would you mind looking over a contract? And not things I was actually comfortable doing because I was pretty specialized, but you know, those are good times, those are, you know, just be aware that you might be the only point of contact and the resource for people out there. So just to be mindful of that. 
and being in business organizations, you know, might increase that exposure if you're in some other areas, which also does tails nicely into our next topic of networking. Um, so beyond the marketing that you spoke of, what do you do to network that brings new clients? And um, Alan, could I start with you? Sure. Um, professional organizations are a great way to start. Another is other types of business organizations or community organizations where you can run into your target client. Um, for me, again, that's broad-based, so I can look at the different organizations that are social organizations or other types of organizations in the city um, that may relate to a particular group that I find interesting and then go in there and talk to them. Um, and when those people need an employment letter, they'll think of me. And that's how it works. You are selling yourself at the end of the day. So the more places you can put yourself, the better it is that you're going to be able to make the contacts that will eventually lead to clients. And you don't have to limit it to uh, legal organizations. Go out there and see what else there is in the community that you have an interest in and go do it because you're going to be happier in those environments. I, I would agree with that. I kind of take the spaghetti approach, throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> um, and I have found business in unlikely places. And you can go to the tip and things like that, and those haven't worked for me. They work for other people. But things like um, I'm on the board of California Women Lawyers. That's been a tremendous resource. Uh, referrals both ways. Uh, Napa County Women Lawyers, Napa County Bar, get really involved in your bar association. And then other community things, like Alan was saying, um, I'm on the board of directors of my local Kiwanis Club. That's been a great source of business, which I didn't really think about when I joined. I just joined to you know, give back to the community, and it's actually been great for business. So things like that are really helpful. Um, I try to have two goals in mind when I'm networking. One is to create you know, the stable of attorneys that I can send people to. You know, I, I have my bankruptcy person that I send people to. I have my family law person, because those are things that I don't practice. Um, but then the other, the other goal that you should have, um, and people tend to forget this, um, be sure to remind people what it is that you practice in. Don't assume that people know what you do, because people will forget. Um, and it's a good reminder, oh yes, I do estate planning, yes, I do probate, so that they're, you know, it's kind of in their brain. Um, I think that's really important. Um, what's it? Um, you know, it sounds kind of funny, but the best uh, network I've ever done is at uh, cocktail parties with, uh, with people, new people that you meet. Um, for me, personally. Now, people have different personalities. You might not be a social butterfly. You know, not that I'm a butterfly, but I'm just saying I'm, I'm a social butterfly. <laughs> but, um, so my best network has been when I go to events and parties and gatherings, have a couple of drinks with friends that tell me, you know, they tell stories, they tell me, and, you know, it's an icebreaker. I'm an art lawyer. Oh, what's art lawyer? You know, that's kind of... Always, uh, so you know, have that five second sort of, uh, I can say, elevator uh, pitch that you have because the art law always gets people's attention. But that's because what I do now, you know, obviously, different practice different things. If you're not somebody who's very social and comfortable in promoting yourself in that sort of non professional surrounding, I highly recommend uh, professional um, things like what is it called? The B &B. Yeah, yeah, so. B &I. Yes, and I and you know, like I um, one one place that worked a lot for me was uh, because of all the art community that I'm involved with, or you know, uh, I can party with. Is that what? No, I'm <laughs> 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 uh, I, I I had the pleasure of sitting on a couple of uh, uh, nonprofits, you know, board, and that's a great place to be too because that puts you on a whole different caliber. You know, you get different kind of uh, people coming in. Uh, so, you know, do that. Do 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 go out and, and, and be part of the community, whatever your community is. So, you know, for me as an artist, I go and, and I, I make sure I support them. Any event happens, I go, I show up. So, you know, just find what you like and you put it yourself out there. People just, they, they like that personal relationship. And that will bring people in. So. I tend to really capitalize off of Christmas and the holidays. In <laughs> it's true. Christmas card. I, yeah, not even the Christmas card, but you know, I this year I made it a point to go to at least one Christmas party every single day during That's the holidays. Right. <laughs> there were some days I was going to, two, and by the time December twenty fifth hit, I never wanted to see another cookie again. <laughs> I never wanted to have another cocktail again. But it's a really, really powerful tool yeah. because you're going to all these people's professional parties and meeting people that you wouldn't otherwise meet. Um, so that. I found works very well. If you don't like going by yourself, go with a buddy who, you know, you can introduce your buddy instead of yourself, swap services, whatever. There's also meetup.com. They, you can search these groups that have all sorts of different interests and you can just show up at their meetings and, you know, 
see who's there. It, it's very time consuming, but ultimately, I feel like showing up places really, really pays off, and creating relationships with people really, really pays off. Absolutely, and then um, just to circle back a little bit, um, do you, um, if you outsource to attorneys, how do you locate them? Um, I, I can take that. Sure. I, um, well, a lot of my um, colleagues that graduate with me, I, you know, I try to go through that. Um, and also because uh, of my my job, I got to meet a lot of attorneys for different because I was negotiating a lot of contracts. So, based on my experience with them, I, I would recommend if the attorney, you know, if, believe it or not, if they actually are um, professional enough at the same time, knowledgeable at the same time, nice, mm -hmm. they're gonna get my business. You know, so that's not a thing. When you deal with other attorneys, try to be respectful. <laughs> Well, I would just say, uh, you know, I, I live in Napa. It's a really small community. There's one really competent bankruptcy attorney, so that's who I refer people to. Um, but being involved in the Bar Association, you get to know people, and you just kind of start putting people in categories, and you end up just having one person for every category. So, you know, you just kind of listen to what people say about attorneys. Um, go on Yelp and Yelp your colleagues. You'll find some really interesting information. Um, I always try to look up people on the California Bar website to see if they have a disciplinary background before I refer them, um, just to make sure that they are uh, credible. credible. Um, you know, other than that, you know. Look, professional organizations, it's all about personal relationships at the end of the day. It's true of your clients as well as the other attorneys you meet. The more you have a personal relationship with someone, the more comfortable you're going to be to refer them business. And Go out and meet people because it benefits you in the same regard. You can meet them. That's your referral network. Mm -hmm. Can I add one thing? Sure. Sorry, just this is like a off the subject a little bit, but kind of following what Mary was just saying. Um, if you notice, well, a lot of us are talking about Yelp. We're talking about LinkedIn. We're talking about Facebook. We're talking about a lot of online, uh, you know, communication and so forth. Um, the, I highly recommend that you look yourself up every now and then. <laughs> okay, people, people will say stuff. If they're not saying anything, that's good. If they're saying, but it's really bad if on Yelp somebody's giving you a bad review. You need, you need to either, whether it's true or not, you need to make sure you clean up your page. So, yeah. and if it's a valid issue, make sure you don't take it personal. You know, sometimes it's good to hear criticism. So please do every now and then go online and Google yourself. Or going out, what you mean? Right. And actually, to, to follow up with that, um, Mary earlier had mentioned you know goals when you're out networking, and I think that you know there are a lot of online resources out there like LinkedIn and Yelp, and we can communicate by email and Twitter and all that stuff. But really, nothing beats face to face. And so when you're going out, you know you'll leave a networking event sometimes with a huge stack of business cards in your in your pocket. You know it's really helpful to take the time and to follow up, have coffee, have you know. Lunch. You know, there's a book that calls that's called Never Eat Lunch Alone Again. You know, which talks about you know face to face and person to person networking. And you'll, you know, a lot of times things that could be you know really great relationship builders will happen when you're face to face. And you'll learn you know commonalities, common backgrounds, interests, and things like that. And statistics show that that more businesses pass between people who have common interests than anything else. So you know that's a really great way of boosting up your referral network. Um, is by following up with face-to-face -face meetings. Um, and what? the next section's on building a network. <laughs> and, um, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. It's on referral panels. And Ruth, I was going to ask you to start this one off. Um, have you utilized referral panels and court-appointed panels to generate clients? How do they work, and what are some of the benefits and challenges? Um, yes, I have extensively. I was on, I think I, I'm still on the Bar Association of San Francisco's low fee panel. Mm -hmm. um, and how that works is they, refer clients out to you, you check off the boxes of the practice areas you're interested in doing, they'll send you a referral every now and then, you meet with the client if you want to take the case you can, you have to promise to give them a discounted rate, you don't have to take the case if you don't think it's good. I have not generated any business from it, um, I've done some intakes but generally it's not something that I, I particularly want to do or I feel like I can do. Um, I was also on the juvenile dependency panel in San Francisco which is a court appointed panel of uh, kind of like public defenders, but for people who are in juvenile dependencies of foster care systems. Um, they recently closed the program, so they're not taking any new people for a while. But you do this year-long mentorship with a mentor, they teach you the ropes, you get approved to be on this panel, you show up to court once <coughs> or something like that, and you do cases, and then you, you know, 
deal with those cases, defend whoever you were assigned to defend. Um, it's a really good way to get a steady income stream. You can foresee what kind of clients you're going to get, what when you're going to get them. It's a good building block, I would say, for developing your practice. Um, at, in this economic climate, with the state having as little money as it has, I wouldn't recommend banking on that being your entire practice. It's good to have you know, supplemental income streams. Um, I think there are a couple of panels still that are open. Like There's a criminal defender panel and a juvenile criminal defender panel that people can still join. And it's, I mean, it's, it's nice that you don't have to worry about billing your clients and collecting and all of that stuff because you just build a state and they pay you within some reasonable, usually, time period. Anyone else have experience with uh, referral panels and court-appointed panels? I have not. I have not either. I'm pro based on colleagues that I, I know have also done juvenile mm -hmm. dependency and things like that, um, what I've heard is that they end up losing money on it because you're paid less than what your hourly fee is with those certain programs. Um, we have the luxury of being really, really busy and we don't have time for that kind of thing. Um, but now I don't have any personal experience with it. Um, I, I, um, the only panel I was on, the only, only referral panel I was on was uh, one that uh, was specific for artists. And I did that at the beginning of my, um, when I first started my practice. And it was really, some of my great clients initially came from that, but the problem with it was, which is what it, it's a discounted uh, rate and you have to pay them. But the problem with it was, um, out of maybe uh, 20, 30, one would be a legitimate potential client. So after a while, I, I just stopped. But I, I recommend them at initially. It's a good way of you know, at least getting some clients out. Or at least familiarity with the issues that you're going right. to get. You're going to get. And learning which ones are good clients and which ones are not. Because you kind of learn from mistakes also. Right, and some of them even offer a mentorship, which is also nice if it's something that you're just getting into. So um, in building a network, um, Masa, I'm going to start with you for this question. How did you build a network of attorneys and other professionals to obtain substantive and business input, bounce ideas off of, and provide and receive referrals and clients? Um, that's a great question for me personally because I will tell you that my best support has been Golden Gate University. Um, the IP department has been an amazing department. I mean, I, I work with uh, Bill Gallagher and Mark uh, Greenberg. I've had the pleasure of you know just uh, having them as my mentor. But even today, when something substantial comes up, I always call them just to bounce ideas back and forth. And they've been very gracious with their time. Um, through them, I've met other attorneys who specialize in other areas of IP or so that I, you know, uh, that they referred me to. And I've actually currently have a pretty good number of attorneys that I work with that uh, either I call them if I need stuff or, you know, if I, if the client that I can't, you know, uh, something that I can't deal with, I send it to them. Um, so this is how I started. But today, also, also all of my GGU alum that I graduated with. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great network. <coughs> um, I lucked out. I had some really, really awesome jobs during law school and fresh out of law school with amazing bosses who I still call all the time and ask them, you know, how to deal with something or what they think of a specific issue. And even if it's not their area of practice, they tend to kindly point me in the right direction. Um, so I'm very, very grateful for them. And I met a lot of opposing counsel that I wound up being friends with and partnering up with and you know, sometimes there are other good lawyers that you encounter and you you know, you just click and you start to rely on them and you create relationships just through seeing how the other person works and understanding that whether you're on the same page or not and it just I don't know, networks build with time I guess. Right. Yeah. Alan? Uh, same kind of thing. I Activity in the Bar Association has put me in contact with uh, my peer group from a variety of different backgrounds in terms of practice. Uh, they've always been a great source. Uh, I have previous employers as well who I have good relationships with and have been able to ask them uh, questions from time to time. I have old professors I've called. I mean, you use everything available to you um, when you have questions. You think about who do I know who's most knowledgeable about this and you go to them. Um, I, have, I have a unique situation because when I have a problem, I you know go two feet over and I ask my husband to you know bounce some ideas off. Um, you know I'll, I'll write an email and I'll say, hey, can you, can you come read this before I send it? And maybe talk me off the ledge. 
um, before I can hit send. Um, that's really helpful. And that's one of the things, if you're thinking about going solo, um, really consider partnering up. It's made our lives so much easier to have someone else to talk to. Um, we have mentors that you know we can call at any time and they help us. And we have classmates from GGU who we talk to. And we have the Bar Association. We know a lot of attorneys. Um, but really, sometimes you just want to have another head looking at something, another set of eyes. Um, so that's been really important for us. Great. Um, and in that, in along the same uh, that same issue for staying connected. And Alan, I'm going to start with you in this one. Um, working by yourself can be fairly isolating. What do you do to stay connected to the legal community? Are you involved with bar associations, industry groups? We've started to mention a few of these, but also maybe about you could talk about workspaces and um, pros and cons of that. Well, workspace, I work with Heather. We run yeah. our own space, it's just the two of us, so that's not much of a help. Um, <laughs> but it, it, both of us have been very active in the San Francisco Bar Association and the Barristers Club, and that, that was a great way to go out and build uh, you know, uh, relationships with people who are similar age and experience, and that's always comforting to hear other people's you know, war stories and the problems that they've encountered and all the different things that you're going to encounter on a day-to-day -day basis and then have someone else to say, oh yeah, no, I know how bad that is. Or, oh yeah, that was great when it, you know, this happens. And it's great to have those things. Just, it, it's going to come up later, but work-life balance, go out and have some fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. And those kind of things do keep you sane. Um, I'm someone who's very content to work alone. I don't need a lot of interaction on a day-to-day -day basis. I have it with Heather. We interact with each other on, on a lot, and there's a lot of back and forth. Um, but I'm not one of those people who working at home or working in a small environment is going to drive crazy. I'm, I'm more than happy to do it. Great thing. Anyone else? I don't, yeah, I don't have the problem of uh, the same <laughs> issue. I'm, I'm not really isolated ever. Just and I work in the same room. We have the same you know office room. Um, our focus is more about dividing our time. Um, we try and do different things so that we cover different uh, areas. Uh, like I said, I've been, I'm on the board of Kiwanis, he's on the board of Rotary. So it's two you know, very different groups of people. We get twice as much <coughs> interaction with the community by doing that. Um, you know, we sit on different boards and we really try to you know, spread ourselves out. Um, so, um, I'm one of those weird people who loves to sit in the middle of a coffee shop that's really crowded and do my work. <laughs> so, if you're running to me in some coffee shop, that's you know that's what I'm doing. I'm working on some contract probably. But I, you know, um, I actually when I first started, I had my own office in the, in my bedroom. Really, that's the first office I had was my bedroom. And then eventually, I you know gradually went and shared a space with other attorneys. And then of course, when I was doing my uh, uh, general counsel work, I actually rented a P.O. box, because you know, I didn't have a physical outlet, I did most of my work on my home, or coffee shops. Um, <clears throat> but uh, about a year and a half ago, when I uh, came back full-time to doing my own practice full-time basis, I um, uh, you know, have been lucky enough, I actually end up uh, renting a beautiful office, small, not that big, but beautiful office, in the Sentinel, Sentinel Building, which is the Francisco Coppola Building in North Beach. So I, uh, I, I get to walk out whenever I'm kind of getting a little crazy, writing for too many hours, I just walk out and there's all these great creative people in that building. I just walk up and chat and, you know, that's how I get back into my, I guess, mm -hmm. zone. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, I mean, honestly, we work in a, in a world that is so, uh, technology so advanced, you can work pretty much anywhere. I use Dropbox, so all of my files are on Dropbox. I can be anywhere. I was on a beach yesterday. I, I mean, the day before, I was working over there. The day, you know, that week before, I was in LA. I mean, I, whatever you are, I, I, it doesn't stop. It doesn't, the physical barrier is in your mind. You, it doesn't have to stop you. So if, if it's in your bedroom or in front of TV, or you want to go to a coffee shop, or you want to actually have a space, you know, depending on your budget and what you want to do. I mean, obviously, we all have to have a space that we kind of meet with clients because you know, people don't want to come. Like my clients. Don't like how my my house is too small to meet with them. You know, I don't have that separation of you know having a space. But you know, you can. There's so many opportunities. All these shared uh, office spaces. You just rent uh, the conference rooms if you can meet the clients and have a virtual office. So, you know, uh, depends on your personality. If you like to be in close space or you like to be in room. When you're out and about, um, you know, if you're in a coffee shop or at the beach or whatever, do you bring your, do you forward your phones to yourself? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. I do. And do I do. Your, are your clients fine with that? Yeah, my I, my clients, yeah. I, as I said, I'm so long with them. I, 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 half my clients I've never met, by the way. 
I, I, did I tell you guys that? I don't know. <laughs> Half of my clients I've never met because it's referral, really. And then, as I said, I'm a little technology savvy, so I like to be, you know, you can do Skype, you can, you know, it's all kinds of ways. I mean, I have clients all around the globe uh, that I work with. And, you know, that's just, uh, so they don't, they don't, when they call me, they don't care I'm sitting in my office. As long as I get to contract with them on time, they don't care where I'm working from. And, you know, if they want to meet with me, then I, I make sure I'm in my office. <laughs> but, that, I, but that's how I like doing my job. That's just what makes me get up every, every morning and do my job the best that I can. It might not work for everybody, but. Mm -hmm. Great. Sure. I used to really like working at coffee shops, and I, <laughs> I still kind of do sometimes, but I am in, I think it's just a phase, but I really am enjoying my phase where I have an office where I can walk in, do my work, and then walk out and not work anymore because if I don't draw boundaries for myself, I will drive myself absolutely crazy, like working until midnight when I absolutely don't have to, or, you know, procrastinating, cleaning my entire house, and like <laughs> drinking 25 cups of coffee before I even start working. So it's, it's good for me to have a physical barrier between work and home and the fun places, and it, it helps me be a lot more productive when I'm working and be a normal human being when I'm not. Do you rely on, do you find yourself at all being isolated or do you have enough interaction with colleagues and clients and things like that to keep it pretty balanced? I have a business partner, so I'm right. never isolated. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we go over absolutely every detail of everything we do together. So it's, and you know, she's good company. So we're pretty social with each other and we work with a lot of people. We're, right. we're working with social workers and adoptive families and all sorts of people in the population, so it's not isolating at all. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other good resources, um, and we can all, you know, just go down the line, um, are there good resources to help you <coughs> in your practices? What are your go-to resources? Like you mentioned Dropbox earlier, Masa, you know, websites, groups, listservs, publications, and Ruth, I'm start with you. I love the public law library. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's mentioned that Lexis and Westlaw are for free at the law library. You can use it for an hour. If nobody else is waiting, you can use it for much longer than an hour. Mm -hmm. I go there all the time. It's where I start all my research. I'll go, you know, use my own lessons if I need to later on, but the law library is my absolute favorite place to go practice law on the cheap. Which law library is there? There's, it's in the War Memorial Building right next to City Hall. Oh, okay. Well, there's also one downtown. Yeah. yeah. Right by the toy store. On the oh, the, the, the Nadnock one? Not that yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. We shut down the one in the courthouse because it's going. <coughs> Yeah, but there's one across the street, and it's bigger. There's one in Redwood City, if you're on the Um Resources, well, um, obviously, as I said, uh, online. I'm a big fan of online. Google, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, I like Google to start to kind of get an idea of what I'm doing. I actually have found Nolo Press to be very good to at least, now, now when I say this, you know, take it for what I'm telling you. I'm not telling you to use Nolo Press to draft your contract. What I'm saying to you, <laughs> what I'm suggesting is, uh, if you don't know and you need to learn an area of law that you're not familiar with, because it's prepared for lay people, it makes it simple. It breaks it down. You don't have to go through these treatises that are like this big, and you're like, oh my god, what am I going to do now? Um, it just kind of breaks it down so you can focus on what you need, and then based on those re the recommendations, and go and find the legal resource that you need to use, and the treatise that you need to use. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Nolo Press. Yeah, and I've already mentioned I love CEB. CEB is so wonderful. If you haven't looked it up, look it up. It's wonderful. I mean, they'll they'll have client letters already typed out for you, exactly what you should say to your client for whatever different situation you're in. Um, love CEB. Um, I also, we use Macs in our office, so I have a program called Bento. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Bento. Bento is wonderful. Um, you can basically customize it for whatever your needs are, so I do all of my billable hours. Um, that's another thing. Make sure you have some way of keeping track of your hours that you know you stick with. Um, I keep track of that. I keep track of our client database on it. Uh, I have to-do lists with timelines, and it's all in one uh, program, which is really helpful. Um, <coughs> Nolo Press is really good. I love Nolo just for certain things. Um, and then we also use things like Dropbox, and you know I mentioned Google AdWords and things like that. <coughs> I like to bounce ideas off of people. I, I like calling people up and, and you know having the interaction and what do you think of this and what do you think of that. And you know Heather and I do that a lot with each other. Uh, but we also from time to time call up outside people um, in terms of how things are perceived. You know, 
again from the litigation. So we often call up a friend and say, you know, I've got this case, this is kind of what's going on. What do you think of it? You know, just on some limit, the person on the street, kind of how things are after them. Also, suing, I just love doing internet research, and I think both of us are great like that. We sue companies. The, some of the best information we've gotten on cases has come off their website. <laughs> so if you are ever going up against someone and they have a presence on the web, troll through their website, you will find gold. So I swear to God, you know, I <laughs> it's a great thing. Um, listservs, I've tried them. They end up being mostly a waste of time. I think they're very helpful in the beginning when you have very broad questions. Uh, but you will end up spending your time weeding through email after email, <coughs> and unless you have the time to do that, uh, you're probably not going to find it as helpful as it's going to be time consuming. Um, I have two that I'd like to add to that um, this great list. Um, one of these are very nuts and boltsy kinds. Um, one of them is called Wave Accounting Software, and it's basically I would call it I would consider it sort of QuickBooks really, really, really light. And it's free, it's at waveaccounting.com. It allows you to, to keep track of time, invoice, receivables, and payables. And um, it will export to FreshBooks and to one other program. And also just in the standard uh, program. It's web-based, so you can access it anywhere. And it's fantastic, and it's free. And the other one is um, called Liquid Spaces. And it's um, basically, it's an online resource that allows you to find office spaces in San Francisco and actually throughout the Bay Area. Um, some of them are at a cost of about you know 20 bucks an hour, but conference rooms are really inexpensive. They usually come with Wi-Fi and there are some <coughs> other great spaces, and some of them are free. And so what you can do is book availability on t online and um, great places to meet clients or just to do some research or hang out and do some work. So. Um, Unless the panelists have anything else to add, I think Jan was going to talk about uh, mentoring resources. Just yeah, well, one. I was just going to mention um, two things, actually. Um, Suzanne and I were thinking about, as a follow-up to this workshop, um, trying to set up some kind of Golden Gate solo practitioner slash independent contractor um, network where people could mentor each other, um, eventually maybe use it as a way for referrals and that kind of thing. We don't we don't want to say what it's going to look like. We wanted your input on what it's going to look like. So what we'll probably do is send everybody an email, get everybody's input. We were initially thinking, well, maybe to the LinkedIn um, Golden Gate alumni group, we maybe have a subgroup. Um, but we'd like to get everybody's input and try to design it where um, it, was, it was really going to work for everybody. So I wanted to sort of put that out there. Um, the other thing is we're actually doing pretty well on time right now. We were going to take a 10-minute break, but I'm thinking if people are up to it, maybe we'll quickly switch the panel and then keep going, and then we'll be able to end early. I mean, I think we want to have a few minutes for question and answer right now, but is that too many people? Yeah. Okay. All right. So maybe just a quick question and answer. I know that um, before we answer question and answer here. You talked about uh, the accounting software. There's also someone pointed out to me recently there's an online web timekeeping called Open Timer. It's free, and I found it much easier to use than any other system that I have tried using. Great. You know, we have time for questions in the back. Um, I have a question going back to the networking and getting clients. Um, we talked about the clients. If you're an independent contractor, and you're going out and networking and meeting new clients, and then potentially bringing those clients into your Respect into your employers that you or employer that you're working for. How do you make sure that because you're your own business entity, let's say that you retain the client if you leave or something like that? Like, how are all the logistics of that? Because networking is very informal, but then the process of actually helping the client is not. So, how did you do that? Um, my first question is: Do you have written contract with your contracting? And I have informal contracts with them, seem to be more formal. But so, as a, as a contract attorney, who actually I deal with independent contracts all the time. Uh, going back to this question that we talked about, I highly recommend every single one of you who's an independent contractor has a written contract that sets out the terms of your engagement. You need to do that. Don't do informal stuff. We're all lawyers. We don't do informal stuff. We shouldn't. <laughs> well, I really we do it all the time, but I'm saying we really shouldn't be doing that. 
But it, if you do have something in writing, you should probably have some kind of language in there that says if you were the lead person who brought this person in, if you leave and not work with them, you have the uh, option to give the client the opportunity to leave with you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, at the end of the day, it's the client's decision. You can't just take him with you. You just, you know, like mm -hmm. my, the law firms that I worked with before, many moons ago, um, you know, at the end when I was leaving, we sent a letter to all the clients saying, I'm leaving, and some of them came with me, some of them stayed with the firm. So, you know, depending, so, but, but I would recommend put it in writing, and also, if you bring them in, maybe some kind of a referral fee that you can get from them. And then I guess also a follow-up to that, when you meet potential clients, you know, is it better to be giving your contact information or when you're discussing with them how you're employed currently, is it better to say, you know, oh, I'm an immigration attorney or I'm a whatever, I mean, sorry. but is it better to say, you know, that I have, that I work for different attorneys or you just say I'm an attorney and then you refer on your own accord or, you know, I would say that you represent yourself as an yeah, attorney right. and refer out because I think the moment you start saying, well, I work with this person a little mm -hmm. bit and that person, yeah. you're starting to diminish your stature right, with a exactly. potential client. So that's what, I mean, I, I guess the question is how to get the client without sort of pushing them away by saying, well, I'm an attorney and I a contract. You're an immigration attorney and you mm -hmm. talk to them about that and if they want to come with you, then you can say, okay, well, look, I associate with this person for these kind of things. And you do that on the back end. If you're doing it for somebody else and they who value your work enough that they're paying you to do this as if you can do it on your own. So always you know, just don't don't diminish your own value of who you are. Because you can you can if you can do it for somebody else, obviously you can do it for yourself too. Yeah. So I don't know the, what the what the status of independent contractors are are some of you doing this till you get your your own uh, feet wet and then bring the clients to yourself. I don't know, I'm assuming most of you are like that. So you know it's important to kind of feel that confidence in yourself. And bring them with you at the end of the day. And, uh, the first question up, and I think this might be a fun one. The question is really uh, can you describe the biggest problems that you've had in dealing with clients and how you resolve them? But I think the broader question is kind of telling some of the horror stories that can come up in dealing with clients and how you've dealt with them overall. And I think we should go right down the line and, and start with Al and work this way. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, the, the single biggest way to deal with a, best way to deal with an unhappy client is to listen. And hopefully you've been listening to them and talking to them and bonding with them before they get upset with you <clears throat> or mad at you. Uh, so that's what we try to do is, uh, is listen. And clients... Um, at least in our area, working with regular folks who have injuries or uh, personal injury cases, they're really shocked when the attorney will just sit there and listen for long periods of time about what they want to talk about. And so if you do that from the beginning, you're likely not to have problems. But if problems develop, and they do in our area for a variety of different reasons, whether it's the outcome of the case, it's, it's coming up a lot in personal injury cases with liens and if you have a policy limit settlement for 15000 but the county hospital wants all the money and the client can't figure out why that's happening and they start screaming at you, you just listen, empathize, and usually that diffuses the problem, in my experience. Are there any typical areas that you see problems occur regularly other than the liens or just in the client relations? Well, you have to, uh, not really for us, it's you have to stay ahead of it. You have to be proactive, and if you're going to have problems that are going to develop, it's because you're ignoring your client. You're not connecting with your client. You're not updating your client. You're not returning your client's calls. <laughs> if you're not returning your client's calls, you're going to have problems. Yeah. Other? Um, to echo that, yes. Uh, one of the best things I like about my practice is I get to pick the people I work for. And we get our clients really hard. It is hard to get in our door. But once you're in, um, you have our undivided attention. And you, a call does not go unanswered. Um, an email does not go unresponded to. And one of my clients told me once, you tell me too much about my case. <laughs> so wow. that's awesome. That's right. um, the biggest problem we've had, and it hasn't come up very much, is clients being, um, clients lying. And not lying about, oh, you know, I had a green suit on that day, but actually it was blue. Lying about, things that they said to another attorney or things that they said to their employer, just material things that change the, the, the field that you're playing on. 
Um, it's in our fee agreement that if you make a mis uh, material misrepresentation, we can dismiss you. And we have exercised that option once. And we only needed to exercise it once. Um, but beyond that, we have really good client communications. And you know, occasionally cases don't go the way clients want them to. We do litigation too, and that happens. You're not in control of everything. Um, but if you've communicated to your client, you've softened the blow, and you've kind of explained where things you know, went wonky or why the evidence doesn't really match up to what we need it to be, uh, you, can, you can fend <laughs> off a lot. You know? I think attorneys sometimes get scared of those conversations, and not having the conversation is worse than having the conversation and having the disappointed client. Um, and that's hard to do as a young attorney, because I think we take it on that, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, and now they're really going to know I don't know what I'm doing. So, um, you know, be, be really honest with yourself and your clients about your limitations in the case, and uh, it's going to save you some malpractice defense in the future. I want to add to what Alan, Heather have stated. One thing that law school doesn't teach you is to, to understand that when a client comes in your door, often they are coming from a severe or an extreme position of stress. And they are as upset as they might be ever in their lives. And just be cognizant that while you're trying to be objective, they are in a very vulnerable position. Um, they don't teach you how to be a member of the clergy. They don't tell you how to be a good psychologist. I wish they did, because that would really help. Um, at least in our practice. We have had some problems with client honesty. We have it in our fee agreement as well. We've probably exercised that provision three to five times where when there is a material change and a material misstatement, we will terminate the relationship. I think that's important because there are some misstatements that you can't undo. Um, and on the flip side, if you make a mistake, own up to it and tell your client immediately um, because that will also save you a lot of headaches. And most people are understanding that everyone makes mistakes. Um, hopefully it's not a material mistake or it's something that you can correct or address. Um, you know, they say in law school, never blow a deadline. Have I ever blown a deadline? Well, yes. Uh, I have blown a deadline, but I've been able to deal with it and be honest with my client. And yeah, you, you eat some fees to, to deal with the mistakes that you create but it's the right thing to do, and it's the way I think you grow your business. Okay, I've just made notes from everything that everyone already said. Um, all of that is valid, so all of that. And um, oftentimes, what, um, what I remember is that clients' complaints were usually, I mean, not just, oh, I wish this wasn't taking so long, or, oh, this is really complicated, or something like that, but there, the occasional time when a client would call and be on an absolute tear about usually about something that my office was doing or the state of the case or but it usually was very almost an attack you kind of you know aside from being completely put off by mm -hmm. that usually when all the dust settled and everybody and the, and the tempers were diffused <coughs> it usually was a mask for something else usually it had nothing to do with me it had nothing to do with the process you know we hadn't made a mistake and when um, I think it was on an earlier panel when we talked about you know suing a client for fees or pursuing fees is the easiest way to a malpractice claim, you know, it, it is really true. And so chances are, I was, I did have a client who, um, who was for a case that we were filing, I did immigration defense, uh, deportation defense, and we were filing a, a case for them and the client was actually relatively ill. And so it was difficult to get in touch with the client and we, you know, we did everything we could, phone calls, um, letters and everything, and because of the treatment schedule, he was having a really hard um, participating in the defense of his case. And um, so he finally decided to go with another attorney, but he had a $5,000 fee that was still owing to our office. So he pursued, 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 and all of a sudden he started alleging, you know, luckily not with the bar, but he started alleging that we hadn't done a good job. And we'd even taken him to the point of fee arbitration to try to get at least part of that because we'd done a substantial amount of work on the case. And what ended up happening was the, um, the mediator called me and she said, you know, and he made all these allegations that we hadn't done our work and we said, no, nope, here it is, we, here's what we filed, this is, you know, what we've, what we've done so far in the case. And afterwards the mediator called me and she said, you know, the quickest way to a bar complaint is to sue a client for fees. Will you just drop this 
if he doesn't go for it and we had to eat the fees. But what started it out as being a personal attack on us and, and all these allegations of not doing our job was actually because he was unhappy with having this big, you know, with his own shortcomings and not being able to participate and also because of the fee problem. So that was something that, you know, I learned later and, you know, I chalk one up to experience. But, you know, communication is absolutely key in my experience. Managing the client's expectations, not just with the outcome of the case, but with what procedures are going to be going on, is also really helpful. So it was a long-winded way of saying that. And what tools are you use to manage the client's expectations? Um, a couple things. One, um, especially when I was doing um, deportation defense, to make it very clear that I could not guarantee a specific result. And I actually put that in my fee agreement. Um, I went over and I said, you know, this is based on my education and experience. This is the result that we should get. However, this is the government we're talking about. And, um, you know, there's, there's endless things that, you know, contingencies that can come up. So I can't guarantee a specific outcome. And especially with my client base, they would, you know, a lot of my clients would say, what are my percentages? What are my percentages of winning? And yeah, I can't do that, I'm sorry, and everything. So being very clear that I can't manage that, having it in writing, and really reinforcing it with both verbally and in writing, you know, just to foster communication, say, you know, it looks like we're doing very well, we should prevail, you know, and so everything looks favorable. That's how I would manage. Anybody else on managing client expectations? Um, I would say that associate with excellent practitioners, not practitioners, yes practitioners, but also service providers. We have a process server and personal investigator, private investigator, who is fantastic and we love her and she's a friend and knows how to find people and assets quickly. Um, in our practice, that is of utmost importance. And she does the, the process serv service uh, work impeccably 99% of the time. Jason, how do you manage your, your billing? I'm the bookkeeper, unfortunately. <laughs> um, we might hire out for that in the near future. Um, it's something that I used to be a software engineer, so I'm pretty good with computers. I've learned the, the black magic that is QuickBooks. Um, it, it really is strange sometimes. Um, but we bill monthly. We take retainers on every matter and we bill against those retainers. <coughs> Sometimes we ask that clients refill the retainers on a regular or monthly basis. Other times we let them spend it down if we know where they are and they're not going anywhere, especially for an established business. We take it on a case-by-case -case basis, but we always bill monthly. We bill not only for our time that we are billing for, but our no charge or our zero fee time uh, to indicate that the client is getting something you know, extra, and they like that. Um, and then we also include on the same statement any reimbursable expenses that we're charging for. Hey, Carolyn. Um, <clears throat> we would. Unfortunately, I was one of those attorneys who did not <laughs> bill every month, at least not at the beginning. And um, so, as a point of cautionary advice, do not rely, rely on your clients to remember to pay you every week. <laughs> um, that's very important. But since then. Um, I do, I, you know, with my clients, which are mostly, which are attorneys, um, I do bill, and because it's staffing, I bill weekly, so it's a completely different situation. One thing, though, that when I did, you know, towards the end of my practice, when I was um, billing my clients, every once in a while to include something on the invoice that was no charge is a really good, even if it's something you would do ordinarily and just do it for free, it's really nice to have something on there to say no charge. Also, if it's a friend or a family member and maybe you're giving them a fat discount or a special rate, sort of reflect that in your bill. And um, and then follow up on those bills if, if they before they become too overdue. It's really, I find it really helpful to follow up with them promptly. Uh, Al and Heather, you're both contingency fee lawyers. Do you do any billing <laughs> at all? I We don't do billing per se, but we do a blended fee arrangement. We're not straight contingency. I, I absolutely believe that your client needs to pay something for your service, even if the bulk of it's going to come from the settlement to the resolution. And um, when I haven't done it, it's reminded me that I should. Um, 
And so we, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not a bill um, per se. In, in other words, it's not something they pay monthly. Uh, it's a one-time payment, and we actually credit it against whatever the contingency that we retain um, at the end. And most people kind of understand that. You know, I, I need some cash flow to keep the doors open. Um, How much are you charging for that? discrimination case? It depends on their income. It's scaled according to their income, and um, people understand that too. So, you know, the executive who makes $700,000 isn't going to get what the legal secretary gets, but everyone's got to put a little bit in, and uh, that way I know that you are in it with me, and it's not just me working my time for free. That's a good idea. We don't do that at all. <laughs> 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 Yeah, good. Um, yeah, straight. The, the thing about a contingency fee lawyer is you don't have any collection problems. The check just comes with your name on it and your client's name goes in your trust account. You just have to make sure that the client approves where every penny goes when it's dispersed. If there's a problem there, then there's uh, the Bar Association of San Francisco has a little arbitration procedure that you do. Uh, but it's super, super simple. Uh, the breakdown is really a, a bookkeeping issue. And so you said earlier you started tracking your time. Is that just to look at the kind of cost-benefit uh, approach to any particular piece of litigation, or was there a broader reason for that? Yeah, it was two-pronged. It um, helps us with um, our profit margins. Are we making money? How much time does it take? And then it helps us when we outsource part of the case, keeping track of that cost uh, in relationship to the case. And then we do insurance bad faith which there's a fee provision that you can get if you go to judgment and prove unreasonable conduct. Same in uh, nursing home cases now, you can get uh, an hourly rate, employment law cases you can, so we found it's great to have itemized um, hourly uh, work that we just uh, run right through our database and it's been very helpful. Uh, and starting down there again, Al, have you ever negotiated the fee uh, kind of after the resolution of the case? Yeah, that happens. It's pretty rare. We don't like to do it. Oftentimes the clients will ask us for that and we just say no. <laughs> uh, basically, there have been times where it's really a hardship case and I feel sorry for the client given the outcome, so I wouldn't say never, but we avoid it. Um, I was told when I went out on my own, do not ever negotiate the fee. You will not be taken seriously. You will be work will be undervalued. I think Masa talked about that. And it's so true. Um, Jay Foodberg in his book, I don't know if any of you guys have it, um, buy it. get it, definitely. It's an easy read. It's a, it's a kind of a fun read. He says when you're a lawyer, and a new, when you're a new lawyer, your hourly rate is unlike anything you've ever been paid before. So you actually have to stand in front of a mirror and say, my hourly rate is $300. My hourly rate is <laughs> Just do it because the first time you say it to a client or a prospective client, it's going to be shocking. And you're going to be a little embarrassed that you're charging that much. Um, but the same person said to me, look, when you go to a doctor for a checkup, even if nothing's wrong, he sends you a bill. So I charge for my consultations. My time is what I have to offer. You know, my time is how I get paid. I charge for consultations, I charge a little bit at the front of the case, and I charge more at the end of the case. Where I have negotiated, I have re regretted it each and every time without exception. So, you know, do it if you want to. You, that, will pro that will almost certainly become the client that demands more of your time, appreciates less of your work, and wants more for free. I think it, it can come down to a cultural or a business or an industry issue. For example, we handle some construction matters. Um, in the construction industry, it's very common for there to be a 10% retention on a contract. And general contractors or people who regularly hire general contractors expect the same thing and to be able to negotiate on the back end. We tell every client, regardless, but specifically on real estate matters, <coughs> that we do not negotiate on the back end. If you want to talk about fees, we do it on the front end, and we can work out a flat fee if it's appropriate, but we will never, and maybe we have, but I agree, we probably regret it every single time that we would have done that, but I can't remember in recent memory ever negotiating the fee on the back end. Um, I, I have um, negotiated bills with clients rarely. 
and that was usually in cases where I was really in a, in a situation where I thought, they're not, I'm not going to get any of this <laughs> if I don't negotiate it. And it was usually at the conclusion of a case when I had, you know, there was the relationship was pretty much over. Um, and, and so, and it was usually pretty successful. Um, I also, sort of on the other side of that, not negotiating a bill when it was already due, but sort of a, a client that had had, you know, we'd done a visa petition, we'd done a waiver, we did, we did a lot of different pieces of business already. They'd spent a lot of money with the office, and I wanted to sort of acknowledge it in some way, and so I did give consideration to, you know, the one of one of the pieces just to say, listen, you know, I just want to, you know, acknowledge that we've done a lot of work together, and so in consideration of that, my fee would ordinarily be this. In this case, it's going to be that, and so you know, so that you know that prevented me from having to negotiate it later. I think this is the thing going to go to Jason and Carolyn, but. I have you had collection problems? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about how you, yes. what, how those collection problems, what kind of brings them to pass, and if, if you can explain that, and then how you've dealt with them. Collection problems um, would mostly come to pass. I mean, I really, really, that, er, that time period where I didn't bill my clients, like literally send a physical invoice. Really, really, really can't say that enough. Bill your clients, every, even if it's, even if there's, you know, maybe nothing's happened on the case, send an invoice. It's also, you know, communication with the client. So, and um, it's a good way to describe what you have done, what kind of work has happened, what progress has been on the case. So, you know, you kind of take advantage of that opportunity. But the flip side of that is by not doing it, um, and in immigration cases where sometimes it stretches on for long periods of time and there's no activity, um, that's when payments would sort of ebb out and they would and they would stop and so we'd have to take it took a lot of work to get clients back on track um, I never had to take it to the point of collections I did write off several cases um, when I closed my practice but for the most part the lack of communication I think was really really detrimental and it took you know three times the effort to try to get people back on track you know letters and phone calls and that kind of stuff and then I did um, I did threaten small claims court with a couple cases, um, and that, that did the trick right away. I've taken one client to small claims, um, somewhat from a for personal gratification because he was such a, a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> After the statute of limitations on the malpractice claim, which he didn't have anyways, but um, he's just he upset me. <laughs> uh, typically we don't, and typically we don't have those collection problems because we do get retainers up front now after we did get burned for $5,000 our first year out. Um, in that particular case, we went to fee arbitration and have, we had to resort to wage garnishments, unfortunately. They had, in that particular case, they had gotten some bad advice after we had ceased representing them and thought they were told by their second attorney that we had made a mistake. In fact, the opposite was true. Um, yeah, it's, it happens. Just to understand that your clients might be talking to other lawyers and other professionals and the advice they're getting might not be the correct advice and there's a lot of information out there. It's difficult for them to know what's the right advice and what's not. Um, we sometimes don't know that we ever give the bad, bad advice because we do a lot of research because we are still young, we're still learning. We over-research every case um, and you will too. And that's how you set yourself apart. You, you go the extra mile and it won't become a collection problem. Uh, we've had two and we're dealing with them currently. At what point did you decide to expand and, and hire staff if that's happened? So I guess I'll start with you. I think you're the most likely candidate. Uh, I started with contract lawyers uh, primarily to help me answering discovery, uh, covering depositions, simple depositions. Law and motion work, uh, that's where I started. And then after that, uh, I brought in uh, an admin to really do, um, just try, I think a file clerk, but when we had paper files, now we scan everything onto a server, so all the mail is opened and scanned in. So we have an admin doing that. Um, it. I started in 94, I hired a, somebody probably in 94, 95, and then after I got a big fee, and then the money disappeared and I had to let her go. And then uh, I regrouped, and I'd probably say I started in 94, and then I had 
maybe two staff by 98. So I, looking back on my career, I would have gotten more staff earlier, and I think I would have progressed quicker in my career and leveraged myself better and worked at a higher level. But uh, the contingency fee practice is up and down, up and down, so it is very challenging to have that money to make those people, to pay those people every two weeks, um, you know, with a W-2. I hired my first associate in 2006, so that's 12 years I worked without an associate. And that was a very gut-wrenching gut -wrenching experience, like, can I really do this? But I was felt myself just sitting on a lot of meaningless small depositions on small cases, and I said, it's time, it's time to leverage myself and, and bring in somebody, and it worked out. Sometimes you jump and the parachute will appear, or jump and the net will appear, some, some people say that. And that's, that was true for me. <clears throat> and what were some of the, the risks in doing that? Was it just the, the fear of not getting the next settlement in, or were there other uh, problems that came along with hiring staff? No, it benefited. It really, it really worked. And the, the money came, the parachute appeared. Uh, I got lucky and hired a very high quality associate that I'm still, <laughs> still working with today. She's got two kids, so she's had a couple maternity leaves. Uh, she's been great, um, so uh, it, it worked out. Carolyn? Um, I, let's see, I, I started my practice, and pretty soon after there, I had a, a paralegal and really someone answering phones. She didn't do a whole lot more than just answer the phones because our phones were super busy. Two years after that, I hired full -time, two full-time admins, and that was a godsend um, because at the time, this was like, 99, this was like 2000, 2001, very paper heavy immigration practice, we're filing petitions like this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to copy everything off and organize and, you know, and do court submissions and everything. So the admins were really key. Pretty much from, uh, I would say my third to, from my third year on, I had contract attorneys that I outsourced to, and I didn't actually hire them on full time. So, and that, that was great because when I got really, really busy, either with preparing cases or writing briefs or whatever, I could, you know, assign work to contract attorneys. They were happy for the work. And then when business slowed up, I could, you know, they understood and, and I didn't need to have it overhead anymore. Jason, have you guys considered? We have an intern, an unpaid intern, who's in college and she's a friend more than an intern and we're trying to give her some uh, work experience. Um, we haven't brought anyone on, um, although we do use some outside services. We try and run a paperless office so that decreases our need for copying. Uh, we have hired our Fujitsu ScanSnap, uh, <laughs> which, uh, considering how much the, the maintenance and the service contract on, is on that and our Xerox copier. Um, but um, good equipment, I think, has helped us as much as good staff has helped us. We invest in technology quite a bit. Are there any of that? Uh, no, um, I'm about to celebrate my 10th year out. We don't have any staff. We use the occasional contract attorney. I think we've hired a contract attorney twice in that time. That also means that we do all of our own admin, which can be very, very time consuming. Mm -hmm. I can tell you in litigation, we not only know what goes into filing a motion, we know how to file it in court, and you'd be surprised at how few attorneys actually know. It's harder to people who don't know how to file motions. Um, and you see the frustrated you know, messengers down there calling the law offices going, well, you don't have this right, you don't have that right. Um, and also what comes along with this, and, and we talk about this, if something's wrong, it's our fault. And it's our responsibility at the end of the day, so we do take that on personally. Um, although I certainly understand the time constraints that the time benefits that come along with having admin staff. So that brings us kind of the last question, which I think is kind of the big one that haunts all attorneys, which is how do you balance your life when, you know, the whole show is you? So. What's that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, well, I think that, and I think it was brought up on an earlier panel too, that um, definitely take time off, but you know, remember you're your own boss. And so while, you know, there are some, there's give and take, there's definitely some advantages to getting a steady paycheck, not really have to worrying about bringing in clients and your rent and paying your bills and getting coffee paper and all of that kind of stuff. 
there is, you know, and there's a certain amount of security to that, you know, you're really in a great position as solos that you're, you know, you're creating your own business. And as, you know, as part of that, you're, you're your own boss. And so, you know what, if you want to schedule, you know, personal time in the middle of the week, you can do that. If you want to take days off, you can do that. If you want to work from a cafe or a beach or, you know, or somewhere else, nobody is there to tell you not to. If you, you know, if you do your best research in the middle of the night in your pajamas and you're cranking away at emotion or something like that, nobody can tell you you can't do that. And that's really one of the beautiful things about running your own practice. You have the freedom to kind of create the workspace and to create your own work environment. That being said, as a solo, it's really, you know, and you're with the building of the practice and also the fact that you're probably going to be pretty passionate about the area of law that you're doing, it's really, really easy to be working at 10 o'clock at night or to be, you know, fiddling around with your website while you're watching TV on the weekend or whatever it might be. And it's good to step away from the computer for a while, you know, get out, talk to people, do some of those other things that you love to do because really the whole rest of it is why you're working so hard. Family, <coughs> friends, you know, all of those personal connections, your hobbies and that kind of stuff. So just, you know, it's good to come up from, uh, come up for air every once in a while. And, you know, as your, your colleagues and the people in your network can remind you of that, it's like, yeah, take a break. Yeah, let's go out for lunch and maybe not talk about work mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it is, it's, it's, there's really an advantage to being your own boss and, and it's a really mm -hmm. exciting journey to be on. So, you know, just, Keep that in mind and, and be there for each other to remind you, to remind each other of the fact that it's good to take a break every once in a while. Before we started our firm, I read a, a, an interesting book called The Four Hour Work Week, which <laughs> was focused more around, I think, sales and marketing activities than the practice of law. But a couple of the messages I took away uh, from it were you, if you're your own boss, you have a unique advantage to take advantage of traveling when other people are not traveling. So Mary and I have taken vacations to uh, New York in early December, and there's nobody there except for New Yorkers Christmas shopping. Uh, you get to go to places and do things which people who have a nine to five working for a multinational corporation won't get to do because of the policies and procedures and other reasons that they can't travel. So take advantage of that, you know, go out in the middle of the day. We were went to our bank and they had a Wii set up and we played Wii Bowling at three in the afternoon. Uh, you work really hard when you're a business owner. So don't forget to, to look up and see what else is going on in your community. We've gotten business because we're off goofing off in the middle of the day. Um, <laughs> there is no opportunity that cannot bring business if you have your eyes and your ears open. So I think relax and enjoy, but we're, I think I'm kind of a workaholic, so I'm always thinking about work, but Mary is good about making sure that I shut the computer off. But if I see an interesting story that's work-related, you know, make a note of it and look it up the next day. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, I think for the first two years of my practice, I worked every single day. And I was really proud of the fact that I was working every single day and did not realize that I was absolutely burning myself out. Um, I just read something that the, the optimal time to do work is between 45 and 90 minutes. 45 and 90 minutes, in other words, don't work past that. Your frontal cortex starts losing its juice. And I think that's really interesting because um, a lot of us don't work in short spurts like that. And if you have worked at a large firm, maybe you're coming in here from a firm or you're used to that kind of pace, um, you're used to maybe a 10 or 12 hour day in front of a computer. And how much of that is actually useful productive time? Are you just sitting in front of your computer because you think that's what you're supposed to do? So when you work for yourself, you get to ask yourself these kinds of questions and really figure out how you work best. And I think um, not working sometimes is as important as working and just letting the synapses relax, letting other parts of your brain fire up. Um, I've, in the last two years, made a resolution to look at art every day at some point, just, just turn to colors and textures and get away from the computer screen or, or the verbal part of my brain. And it may seem silly, but that's what works for me. It gives my brain kind of a, a time off, uh, a, yeah, a, a break. Um, also in litigation, once you file a case, you have deadlines that just come. 
the other side files a motion, you're, you know, you're, you're on somebody else's schedule. Um, and so what I'm starting to do, especially now that I have a family, I uh, we had a child a few years ago, is scheduling fun time. And it's <coughs> as important as the hearing time, it's as important as getting that opposition on file. It's whether it's a lunch off or a day off or whatever, schedule it, respect it, and uh, that's what works for us. Calendar it. We put, we put fun time in the calendar. <laughs> yeah. It's great to hear Heather talk about all those things to help you have a better, you know, more rich life. Because, as Alan said, this really is a problem for a lot of lawyers. Uh, we're, as a group, really, really stressed out workaholics. And it, it doesn't need to be that way. It really doesn't. Uh, you can be smarter. You can take control over it. And... Some of the bad habits I got in, uh, when I was younger, people, it's sort of a macho thing. Lawyers, you're young, you have to work. My cousin said he worked on the weekends for 10 years. And you really don't have to buy into that. I got into the bad habit of, with the litigation practice and being a one-man band, so to speak, leaving bigger projects for the weekend. Well, I'll do that on the weekend. I'll do that on the weekend. And that's a horrible habit to get in. Uh, I got forced out of it because I met my wife and she's like, well, you're never here on the weekends. What's going on? And then I had kids and it's like, well, you're never here for breakfast. We haven't seen you here for breakfast for three years. <laughs> so it's like, whoa, you know, I got to get control of this. And now it's, it's one of my big uh, hobbies to, to talk to lawyers about it and read about it. You can see I'm reading The Happiness Project. Which is a good book. The, the author, uh, Gretchen Rubin, clerked for Sandra Day O'Connor and was the editor of the uh, Yale Law Review. Very, very interesting book. But um, it's a big, big issue. Uh, you, we're, I look in this room and we're all pretty young here. And what we don't want to have happen, as Heather mentioned, is you don't want to burn out. Because when you burn out, your talent's wasted. If you turn to alcohol and you're all hunched over because you haven't worked out in five years and your shoulders are screwed up because you're on the computer all day, you're not going to make it into those, when you're, after you practice for 30, 40 years, you're, I mean, you're a genius. You know everything there is to know. So that's where you want to be strong. You want to go all the way through, have a happy work-life balance, a happy, fun life where you look at art you read happy books, you spend time with your kids. <laughs> I really enjoy this topic because I was a victim of it for so many. I'd come home on Friday and my roommate would say, hey Al, only two more work days till Monday. <laughs> um, but luckily I've gotten control uh, over it. I have three kids now and uh, this was hard, coming here on a Saturday. This was unique for me because I retired on the weekends. <clears throat> Uh, but this is great. It's fun to be here and talk to you, to you all. Carol and I started a group called the Attorney Action Club, and it meets the third Thursday of every month at uh, City National Bank. There's a free lunch, and there's MCLE, and we talk about work-life balance, uh, how to work smarter, more efficiently, and more productively with an eye toward uh, having a good, rich, uh, personal life. Um, so you're all welcome to come to that if you like. I want to add one thing. One thing that I think decreases our happiness is not treating each other with respect. I've noticed other practitioners are mean to each other or disrespectful. Um, nothing makes me more hot-headed than an attorney who doesn't respect another practitioner for one reason or another. We are all in this together, and no problem is too big to be nice to the other side. And I'll just add, I think one of the reasons why we all work so much and why this is such an issue is particularly with, with solos, because it's all you, you take on that stress and you let it manifest yourself in every aspect of your life. It's hard to switch off the mind from the problem you have that can't be solved immediately, or the deadline that you've got looming that you haven't started, or all these different things. And it really is that stress that we take on. And I love what Jason said about goofing off in the middle of the day. <laughs> Heather and I have been known to get done with the hearing and kick off and go to Napa for lunch because we need a break. <laughs> and, and, you know, listen to that. When, when you uh, have gotten something big done and you're, you're saying, I need to relax, everything else will take care of itself, go do it. And, and have that release because it will make it much easier to come back and hit the next step.
We're so lucky in Northern California. We have more staycations within two hours of wherever we are than I think anywhere else I've ever lived. That's a great thing. <laughs> Any questions? Um, Heather mentioned earlier about vetting clients. Can you guys go into a little bit more about how you determine who is a client you should stay far, far away from? <laughs> um, well, we practice employment law. I love an informed client, but um, somebody who comes in with a grocery list of claims that they want me to bring, probably not going to take that client. Um, somebody who's talked to you know five attorneys before they came to me and tells me that, probably not going to take that client. Obviously, someone who has a weak case, not going to take that client. Somebody whose expectations are, you know, I want justice. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's some red flags. I think every field has their red flags. You guys probably have some things that are like, make you. Yeah, you pretty much covered it. <laughs> that was a good answer. I want to. Um, I come from a background of engineering, and part of that was project management. And there's an axiom in project management that in any project there are three aspects of the project. There's time there's scope and there's budget, and you can control two and pick those two. If you have a client who comes in with wanting to control all three, well, how much you're gonna do for how much and how much time you have to do it in, that's, you need to educate them that they can only control two, and it's a well-proven axiom. Um, so make sure that you either have the time to do it and they have the money to pay you, and it's a reasonable amount of work. Um, think about each project with that understanding that if they can't pay you a lot, do you get more time or can you do less? Um, and I approach every client in that kind of nerdy engineer way. Um, can we work together productively? And I'll add that, you know, trust your instincts. If something doesn't feel right, it probably isn't. And I think the biggest problem people have in the beginning is when they're looking at, well, but it's a case and it's money, but there's something not right. And then they're, they're kind of balancing out, do I want the money or do I want to deal with the problem? Oftentimes, people choose the money. That's always the wrong choice. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, I've noticed that if, if there's a little something weird about the client that doesn't quite, you don't quite connect with, or you're wondering about, it never gets better <clears throat> as the page <laughs> 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 It always gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> and to, to detail on what Heather said, if there's, you know, if someone's had a prior counsel and they. And you will, you'll encounter people who have who've had an attorney before you, but they bad, really bad mouth that prior attorney. That to me was a huge red flag because, you know, even if I knew that attorney personally or, or I saw that maybe something wasn't done the way I would have done it, um, it's still, I mean, if they're really bad mouthing that attorney, I'm like, okay, then I'm next on that chain. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's always a red flag to me. Also, it's okay to do due diligence on clients. You can do research either online or with people you know or who might know them and find out more information, especially on a big matter. Find out who they are and what the situation is before you send them a fee agreement. Mm -hmm. That's also the reason I charge for consultations and I charge my hourly rate. Um, I may give a deduction for that for you know, friends and family or other circumstances, but my time is valuable and you, know, you, you need to respect it from the moment you walk in my office and that's just the parameter that I'm going to set. So, but when your when your antenna go up, pay attention. That's really it. Is there a question over here? That was my question. Okay. I just wanted to follow up. Do you how do you tell them you're not going to take their case? Do you do it in writing or do you do it to their face or? You should do a non-engagement letter. Um, it's a good practice. We don't always do it, even though we tell our malpractice carrier we do. Um, <laughs> We, we typically do, um, depending on, if we've met them face to face, we always send a follow up email, especially if we're not gonna take the matter. And we also have a practice, and this has really helped. If you're not gonna take it, find them a list of two or three practitioners who might. And if you can find someone who will take it, and you can help them set up that appointment and prep the other attorney, that goes a long way to building your practice, even if you don't get a dollar from the opportunity. And also, oh, sorry. It's also a good idea to keep track of your, you know, if you take do a little intake for a consultation or just basic information, keep track of that just for complex matters and so that, um, just, just in case. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? So when you do any 
for like, a case that maybe it's not exactly what you work on, but you know some people that do. Do you, do you just say, oh, you, you can call this guy? Or do you usually call the guy first and say, hey, I'm waiting for you. Somebody just, uh, just walked him off there. It depends. Mary mentioned earlier that we refer, there are two to three bankruptcy practitioners in Napa County, and we always refer to the same two to three, and they know that. Um, sometimes we will prep the attorney, but other times, like in a bankruptcy matter, we won't. It, it depends. It's a case-by-case -case basis. We'll do an email introduction a lot of times, yeah. real quick. Well, just to touch on that, uh, just yesterday I had a client who was meeting with that I couldn't take their case, but I actually got on, I had a couple of attorneys I was going to refer them to, so I actually got on the phone with them in my office. I got on the phone and I called the attorneys. I'm like, I've got these clients here, let me give you the quick five minute rundown of their case, can you take their case? And I actually was able to set up an appointment with them, and, and that went a long way. They were like sure. super happy mm -hmm. that I, I took the, that extra 10 minutes just to call another attorney and to set up an appointment with them with somebody else. And so. in their mind, they think that you actually helped them instead yeah. of you didn't help them. Yeah, as opposed <laughs> to just going up and yeah. telling them to go on Google and look this guy up, I actually mm -hmm. sent them some words. I got a favorable Yelp rating from someone just by referring them to a mm -hmm. member, an organization that had a membership of attorneys in their area. Mm -hmm. So, I mean. I just want to add one thing. Because we're not slave, as such slaves to the billable hour as someone who's in a large or larger firm, you, you have these opportunities to set yourself apart. And learning what other practitioners do and what turns your clients on about you, will, it will result in business. Um, none of you have mentioned using enterprise software um, that's specific to your area of practice. So I'm wondering how do you, if, if you're not, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if you are using enterprise software, if you're not, how do you generally do your conflict checking? We used uh, FileMaker Pro. It's, it was originally developed by Apple, and it's a just database software that's very modifiable. Mm -hmm. and. Um, it's, it, I bought a, a sort of a slate of layouts for a personal injury practice, and we've um, built it and improved it over the years. And it can do conflict checking, and, and it's absolutely essential to our practice. It's the mm -hmm. core, it does form letters, uh, and that's what we use. What was it called again? It's FileMaker Pro. I don't know if it, I'd start with it now. There's so many different things, and the cloud is so great, because so you can work on the North Pole or wherever you want. <laughs> But we do have a server, so we can work wherever we want. Um, but there are, it's, it's a definitely a huge decision what database you're going to start off with. You want to start off right. Let me hear what you guys are doing. Um, we have three conflict systems. We looked at Amicus and um, Time Matter, a number of enterprise solutions. Because we are a Mac office, Macs, despite their success over the past 12 ish years, um, there's still a uh, no, a paucity or a, there's not a lot of enterprise software that's fully Mac compatible. Even QuickBooks for Mac is not as good as the Windows version. Um, hopefully that will change one day, but that we're not in one day, we're here. Um, so we use QuickBooks because uh, every matter gets entered into QuickBooks. We use Bento, which is an option of FileMaker Pro. Mm. And we also use Dropbox and we maintain a closed and an open file database in Dropbox as well. There's a couple other ones that you can consider. Clio is actually is a practice management software program, um, which is um, compatible, fully map compatible. Um, there's one that works with Outlook. It's called Credenza that will allow you also to do some billing and invoicing through it, and it's free. Um, and unfortunately, it's not cloud-based, which Clio is. And, um, and then you can get into different practice management software. I know there's several ones for the immigration practice um, that I've played with. but. Basically, most of these practice management software will have some form of conflicts checking. Um, I, haven't, I haven't personally used all of them. Some of them are a little bit better than others, but it's definitely essential. I think just regardless of what tool you use, read the manual or the training guides. Learn how to use it, because if you're using the right tool in the wrong manner, it's as good as not having any system at all. Just so I'm understanding this correctly, the conflict checking, that's when you, you're inputting all your own information so that your 
it's checking for you automatically when you get a new client. It checks to see what you've done in the past so that you're not. That's the theory. That's the theory. <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea. Um, I think that someone, an attorney, should be involved in a conflicts check process. Um, I wouldn't trust any information that a computer gives me. This is all information you're inputting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what I've been doing regarding conflicts is just been writing down a list of every person I've ever represented and opposed. Is mm -hmm. that should I be doing something more than that? Um, that's a good start. Um, I would include principles if you're representing an organization. Either know or write down who the principals, the owners, the affiliated people are. Anyone who might be involved in the matter. Um, because there's an argument that that presents a conflict of interest mm -hmm. issue as well. Okay. Any well, I want to thank everyone for coming because this is a Saturday and you all need your work-life balance. <laughs> and I want to I mention two things really quickly and then um, thank all of our panelists for their wonderful pearls of wisdom throughout the day. Um, we were able to get 50 copies of the Solo Boy Choice. Um, I think we have about 50 people here, so we decided to give them to the people who actually stayed till the end. Um, so that means along with your MCLE um, uh, certificate that you want to pick up, and um, if you fill out the evaluation, if you want to toss that next to the certificate, once you take that, just make the evaluation. And um, I really want to thank all of our panelists who were Thank you.